Good evening, Jim. Evening, David. Right, is it evening or is it afternoon? It's like it's seven. I, I guess that's technically no, evening, right? We're we're earlier than we usually are. Hey, you know what? I I have a um uh I have an interesting factoid I did not know. The reason that podcasters use these little intro music things is so that people who don't have because I have YouTube Premium and I've had it for a long time. Is it because of the ads? The ads in the beginning, so that when they join, the ad can play and they don't, you know. And I mean, I do it because we don't care about don't ad money. Ed, then I don't have to edit it for the for the uh, podcast. I could just leave the intro on there. That's right. So yep. it works out when we do it right. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna count us off like we did the, tonight. Most nights from now on, I actually have gear news to share, Jim. Oh, I. Um, which you don't know about yet, but some people I do. do. Not. Um, are you familiar with Barefaced? audio yeah okay yeah i've heard of it they're a cat they're a cabinet company out of england uh they make cabinets that have what they call an afd i guess it's technically a diffuser um installed uh -huh. in the cabinet which is something they've come up with that supposedly right. is like a port but it's more than a port it actually redirects mid and high frequencies out the back of the cab and there's a reason you might yep. actually want that because it gives you even di dispersion for the for the whole sound spectrum across the room. Um, so it's more like having a non-directional guitar cab, um, which we all know, you know, closed back cabs are highly directional and open back cabs are directional, even though they have an open back. Because um, yep. like if you stand next to one, you, you can hear there's significantly different tonality from standing left or right to it. Um, there's a there's a pretty internet famous video at this point of Robert, uh, Rob Chap uh, Chappers, Rob Chapman, um, yep. having them demonstrate this cab with, and, and they, one of the things they did is they took a boom mic, um, on a, like a, a long boom arm, a, a condenser mic, and they had him play and they moved the microphone around in front of his conventional cab. And then they did the same thing in front of theirs. And it was like night and day different. People like lost their minds over that video. Um, so I decided um, I've been carrying around this 30, 30 something pound uh, Lone Star cab for the for the amp one. And um, it's really inconvenient for certain situations I play in. Like a lot of time I'm going to a jam or something. Uh, I don't have a Blues Junior. I don't really have any desire to own one. I was actually looking at small combos to buy one. I was looking at a Dr. Z Jetta pretty hard. And I and I sort of just punted and I said, you know what? I got good amps. That really isn't the issue. Um, I just need something lighter weight for for speaker yep. for certain situations. So they make they make a couple of different cabs. They make um, a one by ten, and when I tell you the weight on it, you're gonna like crack up. It's like twelve pounds with, wow. the, with the speaker. The one by twelve they ordered. Now bear in mind it has a neo cream back in it. It's fifteen pounds. Wow. My guitar case Bad. probably weighs more than that cabinet. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got guitar cases that weigh that much. I yeah. can show you one right now. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, yeah, if this is as good as they purport it to be, um, I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to we're gonna blow the myth out of the water if it's not, because I'm going to be real, real frank with everybody. But I have a, I have a strong feeling that this is going to wind up being a really good cabinet. And... Um, that it's going to, it may be a game changer for me um, because it's super light. They do, a, they do a two by 12. They claim the one by 12 sounds like a four by 12 um, because of the bass response and everything that's enhanced by the, the porting on the cabinet, the way that it's designed. Um, and right. actually I know enough about acoustics to be dangerous and the way the cabinet's designed, it has a diffuser panel inside. So basically they're trying to eliminate the sound of the cabinet is what they're doing. Uh, they want you to hear the speaker and then they're artificially enhancing the bass response with a port and then directing the highs and, and uh, lows or the, the highs and the mids out of the cab in a specific way. So uh, I, I there's a running thread on the gear page about them that was like, if you if you dig it up, OK, it's out there. If you dig it up, you'll see that, that people were like poo pooing it. This is bullshit. This cab can't really do what they say it does. And um, a lot of that was very armchair like acoustic science kind of stuff because one of the guys of course goes, if it's not three me or it's, if it's not exactly three feet from the wall i think it was three feet um it's not going to work properly and it's like what are you talking about sound is like a laser beam 
it moves in, in a straight line, generally emanating from the surface that's pr that's creating the, the wave, right? So your speaker is right. conical for a reason, um, if, if you didn't realize that. Um, so basically, like, when you're... Uh, your speaker cone is pushing air forward. It's also pushing it this way, you know, across the cab because because you're, you know, it's convex or I think it's convex, right? Where it's pushing air yes. this way and it's pushing air this way. And it, that's how you get that narrow band because it's not like it's not like this. It's like this. Right. Um, so what's in what ends up happening when you're when you're dealing with a speaker is that you don't get a, a wide frequency path. And then uh, to make matters worse, we mount it inside the cab which automatically puts this little one inch ring behind it that pushes right. the sound more focused in a specific direction. Um, yep. So these cabs, they, they basically tell you they're made out of crap wood. Like they're being completely honest about it. Cause they're like tone wood for speaker cabs. This makes no sense. If you design a cabinet correctly, Me meaning if you make it acoustically neutral, it shouldn't matter. Like, and, and, and it totally makes sense. Um, it's kind of a hi-fi approach. But if you think about it, like you still got the the guitar driver in it, which that's usually the issue with hi-fi style cabinets. Um, so this will be interesting. I'm I'm like really interested in what this is actually going to sound like. And I know there are other companies that have done stuff like this over the years, like trying to make a a cabinet that's more acoustically neutral. And then you've got like your oddball right. stuff, like um, Rivera did that subwoofer, the Los Lobotum. Um so, you know, hopefully this won't be like a gimmick. Tra a transparent speaker cabinet. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I don't think it's completely transparent. I think I think tuned is probably a better word well, I, for it. I think that's what they they're going for. It's as, as transparent as possible. Well, in I, other words, it's tuned I, to the speaker, right? I think it's not exactly tuned to the speaker because you can get any any Celestian you want in it, but it's um, I think it's more trying to tune out the inadequacies of why you would want to use special woods and stuff for, spe for speaker cabinets. So my, my, my thought, like, and I haven't shared this on the show before, but my thought about this is like the reason why, why people get all bent out of shape about three quarter inch Bal Baltic birch ply is not really for the reason that they should be. Cause everybody's like, Oh, that's the tone wood, right? It, it's plywood guys. It's Marine grade, Marine grade plywood, which means it can survive water. But here's the, here's the thing. I think those cabinets are built that way and selected that way because they're tough. Not because right. that particularly right. sounds can, good. Because because typically you're going to have someone, whether it's yourself or, or a roadie, throwing that thing up yeah. on a stage, slamming it down on a, you know. I mean, even if you're um, someone as big as, as Joe Bonamassa or um, uh, Keith Urban, who's got, they both got these long... Um, train things mm -hmm. that, that yeah, they are, put them uh, on a, they, they literally have a cart that everything travels right. on they, they call it right. they just roll it out <laughs> but that thing takes a beating going in and out of the trucks up mm -hmm. and down the ramps um you know wherever it goes that's that you got to make your stuff out of really heavy dense yeah and wood i'm okay with admitting that that's the real reason we do that right. um i know other people are like oh well the cabinet has to flex it'll look Three quarter inch Baltic birch is not flexing for shit. Like, let's be real here for a minute. That has nothing to do with it. Maybe, maybe the baffle, depending on what they're using for the baffle material. But that yep. would probably be like the baffle and backing material would probably be the only materials you'd actually care about. And yep. realistically, the, in this specific design, it's pulled it anyway. So you're not going to get a whole lot of resonance from the back from the back panel. I mean, that's just not an issue. Um, right. But yeah, so, and don't get me wrong, like there's still guys out there making incredible cabinets. The guy that used to, to uh, build um, the cabinets for, um, well, I guess he designed the amps too for, for Tone King because he no longer is affiliated with the company. He has a company making these cabinets and they are freaking gorgeous, like works of art, but I don't mm -hmm. necessarily know. So like, of course he says, you know, they're acoustically great or whatever, but I don't know. I don't know what impact that is on it. Well, I can understand, like when you when it comes to something like a Bose or um, uh, what's the Klipsch? Is yeah, I Klipsch. 
Yeah, which Clips um, is, Clips is, Clips makes cheap stuff now too. So they're well, yeah, but I mean, back in the day when it, um, what was it, Alpine or McAlpine yeah, or whatever. Back in the had, day when Alpine was around, it, yeah. and Macintosh, they made the the big ones. Um, uh, these were these were not just works of art because they sat in the home. Yeah, and they were beautiful. And I'm, I know I'm jumping out of guitar speakers yeah, no, no, for right, a right. This is like but, a whole other, other thing, but. The point is of all that stuff, and the reason they were made of such fine woods and everything else was was a was a couple full. One, they had to look pretty. They were sitting in the living room. They were sitting right. in your, you know, in your den. You know, you didn't want to have an ugly speaker in your den. You should see my den. Um, <laughs> the other, I have look. I have uh, Taco Bell hot sauce, um, they, <laughs> and it's right here on my desk because God knows I need it for some reason. Anyway, um, the uh, um, the other reason. Is because in for home use, and we've talked about this before, and for PAs and stuff like that, you're you're pointing in a certain way, right? You're trying to access it. Where guitar, famously, guitar speaker and cabinet things are horrible. I mean, they're just terrible. Yeah, and they're they're, they're 50s designs. They weren't ever right. designed to sound good. Nobody even thought you could do that. And for some reason, most most guitar players thought that the best stuff was made in the 50s. But um, uh, it, they... That's hero worship, is what that is. Right. And if you look, those guitar players, right into the 70s and 80s, it was um, a, a wall of speakers. And why? Because you gotta, like you were talking about before, they're pointing mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. And so I gotta have 80 speakers to point in 80 directions to get... Uh, yeah, a lot of that's that question, but it's also when you're playing a stadium and the PA is only 750 watts, uh, you know, you got to have enough amplification to be heard off the stage. In fact, I've even heard tell of some bands that used a separate PA for on stage blasting out the vocalist uh, in addition to whatever the guitar player and the bass player were packing because they didn't trust yep. their actual live sound to produce enough um right for the for the vocals so right and so a, a lot of this stuff is because when we when we and we go back to this our most favorite and famous um recordings were done in a studio mm -hmm. regardless of how good or bad the studio yeah. was for the palm they, of the eye and, and a lot of times these famous famous rock and roll um uh Rock and roll recordings were okay. We're gonna put the speaker in the bathroom that's down at the end of a hall, and yeah. it's gonna, you know, it's gonna have great reverb because it was in a it was in a bathroom. Right, right. And and we're gonna put the, the we're gonna put a microphone right up against it. We're gonna mic put a microphone in the hallway, and it's a it's a mansion. So we got one hanging from the chandelier, um, probably just so we could say that we hung a microphone from the chandelier. Probably didn't even use it. I mean. I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, you're not wrong, modern, kind of stuff, right? And and think about um, the song "Smoke on the Water," right? That's about them. They were they were out there recording their song. <laughs> yeah, and a place that's on fire. I mean, it's well, hilarious. It wasn't. It was it their well, fire, they, fire their studio the, didn't set the on hotel, fire. It was the hotel or something. The hotel set on fire. Right. Yeah, it was the casino. It, yeah, casino. Yeah, and it's just hilarious. Um, a, a lot of the Rolling Stone stuff, um, Zeppelin stuff. Uh, even, I mean, people don't think about it. The Bee Gees, um, Elton John, um, you know, uh, the Beatles, they all recorded in these huge homes because, yeah, think about it. Some of the best, some of the best sounding, um, acoustics I've ever heard is an empty house, a big well, empty room. Well, so that's a big part of it, but there's actually more to it than that. So, um, well, yeah, but it's it not business and financial. Because you could rent yeah. a house way cheaper than you could go into a studio, and I they was would siphon that. that money off to go do other things that they probably weren't supposed to be doing, um, which was which was a, a big part of that whole scene was what could we get away with with our advance? That's um, why I said there was the microphone hanging from a chandelier, just so you could say I might have a microphone yeah. from a chandelier, just so you could say, well, that chandelier was a business expense. I needed it so I could hang a microphone. Mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And the sound of the glass did this to the to the ambient didn't, sound. Uh, didn't Paige actually buy Headley Grange? Uh, yeah, he did, I, and I think he still he lives there. Grange. 
Yeah, but, yeah. But I don't he know if he owns, still owns it. I know but, he owns but it. you know damn well he got the recording company to uh, or the record company to pay for a big portion of that purchase. Yeah, who is, was that before? Because they they had their own record company oh, soon after on Atlantic, that. Um, but they That's had, right. But they had Swan Song. I think it was Swan Song was their was their uh, label, which was right. just them basically. Right. But it's, it's just funny to look back at that because like I said, the Rolling Stones owned one of the mansions. It's one of the most famous mansions that was used by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I think it was Mick Jagger that owned it. It might have been Keith Richards, but I yeah. think it was Mick Jagger. Yeah. And, I've heard that. You know that it, those are things that I mean, even um going to Stevie Ray Vaughan, who invited him to come out to record? Jackson David, Brown. Yeah, well David, right? David Bowie. Yeah. They was the two of Well, them, David yeah. Bowie, but it was Jackson Brown studio, wasn't it? Yeah. Have I got the story right? I, I'm um, kinda... I think, yeah. So at the time, I actually, I don't even think it, Jackson Brown was involved. I think David Bowie invited him to be on the record, and I don't think he knew that, they were, that it was going to be Jackson Brown um, at the right. time. Right. But I think Jackson Brown owned the studio they were yeah, using. They, they, he, well, no, he, he, I think he actually engineered it, too. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. So, but, you know, it... it, it <laughs> We we look at this stuff, and yet there was a guy named Tom Schultz that sat in a in a freaking um, basement, you know, in, in, or uh, you know, fix room over the garage or whatever, uh, running everything in direct and yeah, doing it just yeah. as well. I mean, and then convincing people that other people played on the record, and yeah, and yeah, so that he could sell more records. Yeah, um, it was like a whole thing. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> you uh, you got what's new, or do should we just skip to Gibson and Dean? I haven't what's new. So I bought, just to let people know, so I bought one of those Manos um, uh, tablet holders. And I think I talked about it last week. Yeah. It went like this. Boop. So I got a replacement. This one, you this got one the, does you great. You got the Hercules that I have. I got the Hercules right here. Mm-hmm. And I also got, to, to, to AB them, I got the, uh, this is the, mm-hmm. that was the name of this company. K and M. K and M. Ah, thank you. That's Says it right there. <laughs> Koenig, Koenig and Meyer or whatever. Yep. Uh, they are an excellent company. And it, this it, guy, look at this. Yeah. I mean, that's a sixteen hundred dollar iPad. I'm doing over a concrete floor. Yeah. I'll tell you how much I can trust this. Koenig, Koenig and Meyer is no joke. Wait, um, I actually, so I'm replacing mic stand equipment as I go. I'm trying to do K and M as much as possible. A K and M is expensive, but that shit yep. lasts forever. Um, and it's well made. Uh, what more can you ask for? If you're going to, if you're going to spend 75 bucks on a mic stand, you might as well spend 150 and get one. That's that right. You won't have to ever buy again. <clears throat> we talked about that. Yeah. I'd rather have a mic stand that I never have to buy again. And I don't ever have to think when I'm on stage that I'm going to be singing like this. <laughs> I never actually had that happen, but I, mean, I have had oh plenty, yeah. I have had plenty of mic stands that were not adjustable because somebody had yep. stripped the yeah, the shit on and them. then somebody else welded it into place and yeah, uh, glued and, it or, or taped it. And then there's the one where the microphone does this. Yeah, it droops because somebody loosened and that's that what, screw. But that really, that's what. Um, no, no offense to uh, maybe I got a bad one, but the Manos one that that and they did it. You know, they had a thing, and they were like. An ad, and it was supposed to be so good. And first day out, <laughs> I, like, I would not like recommend shit. it. It was <laughs> crap. I was I was trying to read it, and went. Luckily, uh, I didn't need you know my notes that much. I, I only yeah, had it for one to, song. But... To, to be fair, you do have the heaviest of the iPad, so yes, I have a. That's a twelve point nine inch. Okay, so to put it in perspective, it's like a pound and a half, two pounds. Yeah, this is a, the heaviest iPad. This is 12 point uh, currently. I know everybody's, oh, the new one is coming. So this is the M1 chip, iPad, iPad Pro, um, 12.9 inch um, in a UAG yeah. Kevlar case. Yeah, which means it's now five pounds. And just to add a little bit, yeah, which is also very heavy. So it could be shot by a nine millimeter. Um, and then yeah. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I don't, it's like I good for that. <laughs> It's good for six feet. Good thing because I uh, I had it fall over already, um, and uh, 
And just to add a little more weight, I have a pencil on it. Oh, you have the pencil on it, too. Because you got to have the pencil to, to weigh is, it down that much another, more. Which is another uh, eight, eight ounces. <laughs> I'd say that Point overall, ounces. this thing probably weighs, I bet you I, I'm holding four or five pounds in my hand right now. Yeah. That's how, yeah. That's how I mean, heavy this is. That's not a surprise. So, all right. But so you're, we got Dean and got Gibson. We got Dean and uh, Gibson we need to talk about. Oh my God, this Dean is, Gibson! This is the uh, this is the pre nobody talks about this. This is the pre-show like <laughs> conversation. Then we'll do the then we'll do the the precap, and uh, <laughs> I'll do my I'll do my dog and pony to try and get people to subscribe. Um, okay, and then we can go from there. Okay, so I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with my dog and pony. I I just want to talk about facts. Um, I don't have exact dates, but I do have time frames. So, um, but I can get exact dates if people are like, oh. Yeah. So a lot of people have been putting a lot of effort into um, the Dean Gibson thing. And it's because, let's face it, if you demonize the big guy, right? I don't care who the big guy is. Um, it's easy, whether it's Walmart or Amazon or who or Gibson. It's easy to demonize the big guy and then make um, the little guy look like the hero of the day. But let's just say that both of them were idiots all the way along the way. So I'm going to do it fast. In the 50s, obviously, in the 50s, Gibson came out with the V and the Z and the um, sorry, not the Z, the Explorer. You mean the and the they, Z? <laughs> yeah, and they bombed. They were yeah, they were not like they were there were less they than sold 20 in the hundreds. <laughs> yeah. There was less there was about 100 V's and I want to say 20, 19 or 18 explorers. Yeah, I think it was like 24, and, but but it's a low number. Yeah, it's a really It was less number. than 25, I know that. And um there were two moderns. Both of them were um were built for the show and no dealers wanted anything to do with them. Yeah, cuz they were So Hot garbage, right. and they still are. Yeah. In my opinion, you could take a Modern. You could say, Jim, I will give you this Modern. I would love to, to have I'll... one of the the Epiphone reissue Moderns they did. The, oh, you know really? Talk about I didn't Epiphone, did, did but just because they're fucking stupid, like who would buy that thing? I mean, I know, I, right? I'd like to have it on my wall. It's just like, hey, that's that stupid guitar that nobody ever wants. Like, there's there's two people that um, I know about. One person I know who at least, I don't think he owned, but has at least seen and touched and had a upside-down V, the backwards V. Oh, God. And that's our, our friend of the channel, um, Robert Jackson. Yeah. Um, I, and then there's that Canadian guy, Samurai Guitarist. He has one. He loves yeah. it. I'm not going to put him down for it. I, If you love it, that's cool. Um, I don't like I Dijon Mustard either. I think he loves either. it ironically, the same way that everybody else sort of loves making fun yeah. of that guitar. He, that's, yeah. yeah. So anyway, there's that. And I think Trog, I know Trog has had one, but I don't think he has one. Um, you know what's funny? Um, the reverse V sold more than the originals did. Isn't that weird? It did. <laughs> <clears throat> um, uh, uh, according to uh, Samurai Guitars, more, but anyway, that's off topic. Yeah. So, in the 50s, they introduced them. They didn't sell. Albert King famously picked up the mantle for the Flying V. And then there was Hendrix. And then there was yeah, a lot uh, of Gibbon. People, a lot of people picked up on him in the, six, the late 60s, early 70s. So Right. And so then Gibson said, oh my God, we've got to release a V again. So they released a V. And they did it wrong. They released the Vs. And then Shanker played one. And the V the V2 came out, you right. know, and the E2 came out and tried to put new life into an old thing. But they never really took off. They've never been a cash cow for Gibson, let's face it. Right. Gibson's never said, wow, if we didn't have the Flying V and the Explorer, I wonder what we would do. And there's been plenty of companies that were ripping them off. Uh, well, not ripping them off. Using that body shape yeah, over the years. Yeah, but it wasn't years. a cash cow for them either. Which is Except why Dean. Eh, right, that's debatable. Uh, Dean, Dean's been in bankruptcy twice. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. So Dean, seeing that it was the Michael Shankers um, uh, of the world that in the late seventies, early eighties, that were really picking these up, Dean came out with them. Now here's a here's a fun fact for everybody because all of a sudden everybody's like, 
oh, that Gibson had about decades to do that. No, they didn't. They did not have a trademark. And that's the important thing. That's the important thing to remember. Gibson did not have a trademark on those, those shapes. They weren't worth enough money or whatever. Nobody filed a trademark. So Dean puts him in. Dean didn't file a trademark either. Both of them, for decades, two decades or more, could have filed a trademark, and neither one did. It wasn't until relatively recently, um, I don't know when Dean went to Armadillo, Gibson filed a trademark on those. Dean went to Armadillo, and Gibson said, hey, let me uh, cease and desist. That's when it happened. So, the the um, was was Gibson granted their trademark unobstructed? Yes. Well, that's just it. Was it unobstructed? I don't know. And and of course, filing a trademark does not mean you automatically have no, it. No, it's usually like a seven year grace for people to file lawsuits against you. And yeah, it's the and thing. Dean and Armadillo. Well, I don't know if it was Dean at the time or Armadillo at the time, but they could have said, "Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, no, we've had this." We want to file a trademark on ours, too. And that's when it all went to poop. And that's why Gibson won the lawsuit. And they didn't, as we know, they didn't get a lot of money. They are, and I said this, I, I wasn't sure, but I said, I'm willing to bet that that $4,000 was just a slap on the wrist, yes. But then they got hit with the legal fees, which was a lot more. And... Uh, they said, screw you, judge. And I don't think that was a good move on their part. We're going to continue to make the damn things. And then, of course, you know, we know the fallout. The, there was embezzlement. Possibly, there's alleged embezzlement, I should say. Um, and uh, they um, have had the mom and the son. I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. When a mother's got to go up against her son for the legal side of the, of the thing... Um, to say, hey, you embezzled money from the company. What the, what now, the hell does the, the embezzlement have to do with Gibson? Well, he was embezzling money. Um, nothing to do with Gibson, but he was embezzling money. Um, this just and sounds telling... like people in forums bitching. Like, oh, they're, they suck. It's like fanboyism. They suck because but, they're the evil empire. Well, they suck because no, no, they, their manager is an embezzler. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I don't think they suck because of this. No, I'm, just, I'm, happened, just, I'm just saying that's the kind of shit that you would hear in a forum. Like, right, on the right, right. Page, you know? And I'm just stating fact. I'm not putting any you know judgment on it. I don't know if he actually embezzled. Remember, this is a mom. No, 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 no. no. I know, it, but I'm just saying why, is this, relevant, why about, is this relevant to the lawsuit conversation at all? Well, in a way, because... At the time, it's just it's just the environment at the time. He was telling the legal teams, don't worry about it. We're going to continue to put these on our site. And you can still look up on their site those yeah. things. You can't directly link. You have to kind of indirectly well, link. I, 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 get to it. So, so here's, here's the one thing I want to share with our listeners for, as we continue. I mean, everybody, when you hear the fact that Dean was continuing to sell these, listen, Gibson has lawsuits with four other companies right now, at least that we know right. of, and I've heard there's more, and not one of them I know of has actually stopped selling their V-shaped or explorer that's shaped right. guitars. That's right. So that's absolutely correct, and that's what I, that's that's the that's why I said I'm stating fact, not trying to, you know. So can, can I can um, I posit why that's going on? Because I think all of those companies are sort of pointing the finger at one another, saying, "Well, they didn't have to stop, so why the hell should we?" Right. I mean, why should why should Dean stop when ESP didn't stop? And you know, name another company that's mm. got. I mean, ESP famously Schechter, maybe I don't know about well, Schechter, yeah, but, but we, I do know I do know ESP um, slash LTD. Um, but I thought they lost against them. Um, so the fact is that here's here's the facts. There's a lot of drama. Let's just say drama going on with Dean that may or may not be worth anything because just like what we talked about with Zappa's family, that might just be, you know, we don't know. I, I mean, I, and, I'm not a, I'm not a trademark attorney, but I would suspect yeah. that their trademark is not going to hold up long term in court. Uh, probably Gibson, Gibson's because they because they didn't defend it for 50 years. Uh, I mean, if they did defend it, it was like for other reasons. 
It wasn't, and and there, I mean, it's not like Dean is doing anything new. This has been going on since the 1960s, well, probably the late, late 60s, really. Right. But, well, that's the key, is there was no way, not that, and again, not that Gibson really cared at that time to do that, but there was no way for Gibson to file a, tr um, file a problem with the trademark when there was no trademark to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Exactly. They did not trademark. Yeah. And that's the key. And that's the thing that everybody because there's everybody like, oh, is Fender gonna do that? No, we've already just, we already know it's, there's no legal there's no legal way Fender could do it. Already gone. No more the Gibson could file against anybody making a Les Paul style guitar. That's that bridge. That yeah. water has gone under that bridge. That boat has sailed. No matter you want no matter how you want to put it. It can't happen because they didn't file trademarks in time. So <clears throat> that's another reason that this may or may not end abruptly, like you said, because there may not be any way for uh, Gibson to, um, you know, continue to, to get this. And Dean may be able to go right back to doing what they were doing. Yeah. I and mean, remember, this happened with, with Paul Reed Smith in 2001. Right. right. And they got appealed the first time they lost, and they got appealed, and they won. So that's why I said, yeah, like, I don't know. Two thousand two, two thousand three. I don't necessarily know that this goes anywhere long, long term. I don't. I mean, this is like a, a temporary short setback for the industry. But but part of your that's original right. conversation about this is like, who cares? It's Dean. Like right. I, I, honestly, I'm. That's kind of where I'm at. Like I I give two shits about Dean. Um, to yeah. be honest with you, like they're a, actually an Illinois connected brand because they were like that's where you know Dean started at. Um, I think it was at down at Springfield actually. Um, yep. and, uh, Dean Zielinski's still around. Uh, he's the original designer for the company. He did come back at some point in the nineties and did designs for them. Never took control of his company again. Um, basically ran the company into the ground the first time around by ripping off Gibson designs. That's pretty much what they made. And then, uh, I know it went through a string of bad investors. Um, who didn't know how to run the company. And then sometime in the late eighties, they sort of turned it around for a little while. They ran until the mid nineties on a strong run of, you know, that style of guitar that was popular in that, at that, at that time frame, really late eighties time frame. And then um, what? So like, I think it was in the late nineties, they sort of had a second Renaissance because they had a new owner come in, uh, pumped a bunch of money into the country. He died of cancer a few years ago, I believe. Oh really? Um, I didn't know that. Was. Yeah, uh, he's a bass player. If I, if I, I'm now. I could be getting this wrong. So you know, grain of salt. I'm pulling this all from memory. Um, and after that, they've largely just collapsed. They've lost yeah, a lot of their endorsees. <clears throat> They're not yeah. really putting out anything of note, except for every once in a while they do some custom shop, you know, dime bag mm, signature. Right. Um, Which. They're in they're in hot water over now too. But. How, what are they in hot water on that one for? Uh, apparently, Dimebag's estate is suing them. Um, yeah, because they were not compensated. I think. Right. Uh, there was something. There was there was some lack of compensation. So it sounds like they're actually already having money problems, and yeah. it may be a result of this lawsuit. Um, I doubt it. I bet you this is long, oh, much longer. With it, with a company that size and with the small, the size of business shrinking like it has for them, I wouldn't be surprised if a if a hundred or two hundred thousand dollar legal fee bankrupts them. I mean, that's that's yeah. kind of where they're at financially. I don't I don't see Dean as being like this powerhouse with millions of dollars backing them. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It just depends. It depends on what their their loan with the bank looks like. It depends if there was embezzlement and all that stuff. But but let's look at the other. I mean, there's a ton of other brands that are involved in this in this conversation because let's face it, everybody was making Gibson clones at some point. I mean, we got yeah. we got Ibanez who they had their lawsuit uh, thing with them, and then they went off and made the Destroyer and some other guitars that were very similar but not the same. Technically, the Destroyer yeah. would be in violation of the Z at this point. Um, or the uh, yeah. <laughs> Explorer. The Z it, it is actually a Z body. They call it the Explorer for some other reason. Yeah. It's a zigzag body. That's kind of the point. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, it's like I know ESP is still doing the Firebird shape, and they brought out those V's for for the Nam show. So I don't. Yeah. They, they're basically giving them the finger too. Like I don't really think this is actually going to amount to anything. I think Gibson nope. would love to retroactively somehow get. 
some protection here. I don't see that happening. Um, no. It I, honestly, that's what it boils down to. You're coming into, if you're a new CEO and you got, you know, whole new leadership staff in a company, you go, you, you sit down in a boardroom with everybody and you go, all right. What is our assets here? And somebody says intellectual property. And maybe it's right. a meeting with the legal team. And then you go, well, what's our intellectual <clears throat> property? Well, we're not even protecting the shapes of our instruments. And it's like, you're kind of screwed because all of those shapes were invented in the 50s and 60s, in the early 60s. That's right. So it's like, what are you going right. to do now? You can't You can't go retroactively get that now. Nobody. That's why are I you, said like other companies wouldn't even attempt this. Like they would just be like. When you think about it. On my wall, there isn't a single guitar shape, with the exception of that Taylor right there. <laughs> I don't know if that's even a, a shape enough to go. I don't think I have a shape of a guitar. Where's my strat? I don't uh, that would constitute something that was built or invented, shaped, whatever, after 1950 not, or 58. Nothing up now, there. Now let me ask you a question. So you have the you have the silver sky, right? And I think we would all look at the silver sky and we would sort of say it's similar to a strat, but it's definitely PRS. Yep. But like we know there are guitars out there that have basically the same feature set as another guitar, but maybe it looks slightly different. So which is it? Which is it? This is the same right. thing about the the boat that you take a you know, that you take apart and rebuild in a different places that's still the same boat. What if you change out the parts? Like you rebuild the you you change the parts one at a time over time, you know, and it is it still the same? Right. Part? This is the same allegory because is the guitar really its feature set? Like if you have the same or, bridge and the same neck shape and everything, but the body shape is different. So like, I think that's yeah. ultimately where this ends for me because I'm right. like nobody's really making an exact copy of a flying V. That's just not happening. No, um, and and yeah, and that's what I was gonna get to. Nobody is making, well, with the exception of Chipsons, <laughs> nobody is making. And even they're not exact copies. They're I know not I exact. Have a, okay. I have a Chipson. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I get stuck with mine. <laughs> nobody, and nobody would give you 20 cents for it. Uh, nobody. Somebody would um, at this point, but. Yeah, maybe. They, they might give you a couple hundred bucks for it, actually. Um, it, nobody is. is I don't think for a minute, I'll say this, I don't think for a minute that any of the guitar companies should worry about guitar shapes or colors or anything. What they should worry about is making a fucking good product yeah. that's quality, that fits the desire of the user. At the end of the day, that's what matters. No one buys an ESP because it looks like a Les Paul. People buy an ESP because they know they're getting the, the goddamn Japanese, well-built, well-crafted, um, high-quality yeah. guitar it's, in, a, in a shape that they and, recognize. And that's really what Dean's problem is, right? At the end of the that's day, right. that's why Dean's in the toilet because they right. were selling import trash. Garbage. But most of it was hot garbage. Um, yep. I can remember people complaining about about um, plywood deans and stuff like that being a thing that if you get a solid color dean, it might be plywood, and like that's fine. Yeah. We we know we we've had this conversation on the show. Plywood doesn't matter. <laughs> it probably doesn't actually matter at all. That's plywood. But... Yes, guitars, folks, are plywood. They are three ply guitars. Plywood, yeah, but, right there. The definition of plywood. But the thing is, it was the same price as you know what I mean. Right. Like but when you're buying it, <laughs> when you're buying a Dean, it's the same price as whatever competitive right, guitar right, that isn't yeah. built that way. And so it's like, right, right. There is a little bit it's of tough. this is kind of weird. But anyway, so let's get out of the what's new. Um, I want to do the I want to do our our precap. Um, sure. so the topics tonight are we've already talked about Dean. That was a, kind of an impromptu topic prompted today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was worth having a little bit of discussion about what was going on in that lawsuit and stuff. So um, at the risk of having that conversation yet again, because I know we've covered it on the show numerous times at this point. Um, I w we're going to talk about uh, what's appropriate cover behavior. So um, we're going to talk about uh, our guitar styles, uh, what Jim and I, how we uh, approach the instrument. 
and uh, what it says about us. And then we're going to ask it a very important question. Can you succeed in the music business? Um, yeah. And uh, so without further ado, let's start. Let's talk some appropriate cover behavior. Um, I, Jim, you, you, you prompted this, so I, I'll let you take the lead on this topic, but I, I have thoughts. I have All right. Thoughts. So this, this, I, I kind of stole this, not from a new, uh, podcast or YouTube thing, just from something I saw where I don't even remember what guitar instructor YouTube channel. They were like, um, they were talking about how, uh, people would walk up to them and say that their cover needs to be exact. Mm. And that I think I saw um, the same video. I forgot who it was. Yeah, that it's important that you be exact. And he said, I understand that when I teach a song, I might want to teach the way it was played and then show some of the ways do it yourself. But I, it, but at the end of the day, you got to do it your way. And um, that was that was what prompted this because for me, um. You know, I'll give a prime example. So I, I cover a, a Jesse's Girl. All right? So we do it well. But there is no way I'm going to do every single little thing that uh, Rick Springfield did and then what um, uh, Neil Giraldo did for the solo. Thank you. Because they're two different guitar players. And one of the things I know is in the moment I'm singing it, so I've got... My foot pedal here, my microphone here, my, you know, everything, the, the, the studio here, or the, the people literally right in front of me. I'm not Geraldo, and I'm not standing on a stage that's, like, got people 12 feet away from me. They're right there in front of me. And <clears throat> I've got to whip out that solo, which lasts about eight seconds, if that. That solo is very fast, and it's very intricate, and it's, and it's very singable. So I don't play the double stops. In the first time, and I don't play the um, he he does one note is tapped that whole solo, he's got one tapped note. I'm like, first of all, that tap note has to be dead on, so I do a bend into a uh, um, uh, you know, into a, a note that I know I, I'm hitting, and so uh, and then I do the first double stop one, I do is single notes, I picked one of the two lines. And I play the higher line, which is the one you kind of sing along with if you're going to hear it in your head. And then I don't play the harmony line. And then the second time that he doubles double stops, I play the double stops. And it's, it's an interest. I can play it sitting here. I can play it that way. But standing on stage and in front of a bunch of people. And the other night, I had a light right down in front of my face. I literally could not see the neck of my guitar. And I had to pull that off. Uh -huh. And so... Been there. I, not going to do it. I'm just going to play the best I can in the moment, and I'm going to get out of it as fast as I can. <laughs> and that's what I did. So it was literally like I may as well have had a blindfold on. Uh, uh, you know, um, it's like somebody wakes you up with a flash camera. I mean, that's that's what it looked like for me um, until finally somebody moved the the lighting for me. So I'll get more of that in the gig report. But the the um, the important thing I'm trying to say is. I don't want to be Neil Giraldo, and I don't want to be Rick Springfield, and I don't want to be Buck Dharma, or David Gilmore for that matter. I want to be me up there doing that. And if I can't be me doing it, then um, I guess I'm not entertaining enough because I'm just a, you know, I'm just a 58 year old dumpy um, <laughs> uh, guy who is playing guitar on stage in front of maybe. 100, 150 people at the most at a time anymore. So I'm not, I don't care. Okay. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think I want to entertain them. This. Yeah, in the moment. Go for it. Because right. you're more of an original guy. All right. Although I know you play covers. I do. So that's um, why. I'm... All right. So I, I can come at this a number of ways, but like, um, I want to approach this by like just asking some questions to the audience and like, letting them think through some things first before I start talking about what my position on this. So number one, like what is a song, right? It's like, think about right. the components that make up a song. You've got lyrics, you've got rhythm, you've got chords, you know, chordal harmony, usually. Um, and yep. you've got melody. We always have melody and you always have, 
you know, rhythm and, and lyrics, right? And then chordal right. harmony most of the time. Because um, occasionally you'll get into something that doesn't really have any chords going on. Or maybe there's not right. multiple instruments. Um, and it's all single single note stuff. But but in Western music, that's what you're going to find, right? And so, like, when yep. you take apart a song and you realize, like, that's the basic component of this. And that's even outside of structure. Like, that's not ABA structure. It's not, you know, verse, course, bridge. It's this, okay? Those other things are irrelevant for the purpose of this. Um, we had Michelangelo Badio on the show before, and he talked about a skill called arranging and how that that's yep. actually a copyrightable thing and that people make their own arrangements and they're allowed to copyright them and they get paid appropriately for them. Um, yep. That stuck out in my mind as I ventured down the, the path of, you know, doing covers, right? Um, right. And I'll say this. Um, I think our mission as musicians in a cover type situation, anything, whether you're playing with an originals band that's doing a cover or you're playing in a cover band doing your thing, is to remember that, like, people in the audience need to understand what you're doing. So, like, if right. you're going to go around and you're going to play, you're going to, let's say, uh, I, something comes to mind, uh, uh, there's, like, a super slow cover of a Tears for Fears song, um, Mad World. Oh yeah, I love um, with with piano, which like everybody knows that that version was in Donnie Darko, and um, yep. that made the song really really popular again. Um, yep. And uh, the reason I pointed out is because like, what's the standout element from the original song? The lyrics, maybe the rhythm is also carried over, but basically the instrumentation is totally different. And I don't think yep. if you went into a club and you heard some guy doing Mad World that way and had never heard it in the movie, like, I don't think you would be like, wow, this is a shitty cover of that song. Like, nobody's going to say that. Nope. Um, so when I hear, like, some guitar player on YouTube, and I don't know who it was, so I'm not even calling anybody out. I don't even remember at this point. Um, yep. Somebody was talking about, how, like, you didn't play that cover perfectly. No one cares. Most nope. other guitar players don't care, okay? No, nope. they might think it's cool if you can. So, like, let's let's talk about like Zach Wild, right? So he goes around and does the Randy Rhodes covers, and he can do them note for note. And um, as part of, it's not really covers because it's part of Ozzy's band, but it's you know it's basically a cover because he didn't play it originally. Um, and you talk about that uh, that phenomenon, right? Like, yeah, it's a cool thing to be able to say that, you know, hey, I can follow in the footsteps of this literal giant who also happened to be a very tiny man. Um, you know, I I get the 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 like the uh, fist bumping culture of that. Like, that's really cool. You can do it just like the record. But at the same time, like. Does the audience necessarily know if you can get it 80 percent of the way there or even if you make it your own? I mean, in some ways, I think that's actually a more creative act. So I just got out of Old Stumpy, and we played stuff in totally different styles than what it was originally written. I mean, I mean we turned everything folk or bluegrassy or, you know, even punk rock in some cases. And it was just done because that was our style. Like, that was how we all play. And for, mo for the most part... um like our audiences liked it. They would come up and tell me how great it was. And it was like, I'm, you know, those are great tunes and I'm glad you played them that way. And it was like, Oh, all right. But, um, I think for the most part, it just depends on what situation you're into. Like if, if you're doing the, the dinner band scene, which, which is a thing we have around here, like on Friday nights, you get dinner at eight band plays at nine. Everybody hangs out for an hour or two and has drinks and then goes home. And, um, so the dinner band thing, like, it's 50s and 60s blues covers and stuff. And it's like a little dancey music, but not really like dancey like you'd think in these, you know, little, you know, family restaurants and stuff around here. Um, it's, that's a different thing. People expect you to be closer to the music, but you know, I think all of this spins off of this particular part of our musician guitar culture. And that is the group of guys that were like, I want to sound exactly like the record. And so they were the ones that were adopting the pod and stuff and going down this path of like trying to sound identical to whatever it is they were doing on every single song. 
And it's like, for me, that's not my pursuit at all. And even if I was going to note for note something, I would probably still try to inject my character into it. Yep. And that's where I'm like, we're supposed to be performers, right? This, that's, that's our business, right? We're music. Being a musician is a performance art. And so right. you don't go to um, classical music where there's a violin solo and expect the violin soloist to play it like the violin soloist 50 years ago when, when the recording came out in the fifties and everybody was excited about it. Um, you're not expecting to see that. Uh, so like the Goldberg variations or are you, is it, is it the, I think it's Goldberg variations, right? Which is the, right. um, the Bach recordings and nobody's going to go and expect to see that same style of performance from another performer. They're expecting to see that performer play the music in the style that they are accustomed to, um, you know, but, but still basically the same music. Right. Uh, I right. think, I think classical music is a horrible comparison, except for when you're talking about soloists, because that's really when they get to put their personality into it. Because actually in classical music, they train them to basically like take their personality out of the equation in order to perform it. Cause it's supposed to be performed just like on the written page, which right. I don't know that that was ever actually a thing back when that stuff was being performed originally, but it is now. Um, and, um, it's just an interesting thing to it's an interesting thing to complicate uh, to to com um, to contemplate, and it's also right. com and it's also complicated. Um, Correct, because I think we all sort of have to ask ourselves what we want, right? And for it, for me, I can tell you verbatim, I I have no desire to you know learn other people's music identically. Uh, that said. I'm also the guy that shows up to open jam and somebody calls a tune and I'm like, Oh, I know that one. And then we get to like halfway through it. And I'm like, shit, this is starting to A or an E, <laughs> you know? Um, and it happens all the time to me. And it's like a song I played like a hundred times or, you know, whatever. And it's just like, whatever. I you know, honestly, like I'll make do with what I can. And so, and to some extent it is about that, like being able to get through a situation when you're, um, you're negotiating a, a tough situation like that. So that that's my two cents. I think when, I think it really depends on your, um, on your slant, but also the situation you're in, like what's appropriate for the situation you're in. Yep. If I, I agree. If your band's name was like, you know, seventies radio and people come out, they're going to want to hear exactly what those hits sounded like on the seventies radio. Right. And that's that would be a situational issue that you would have to overcome. But if you're a band like Old Stumping and you're playing like top 40s hits from the last, you know, really since, you know, pre-1990, then you can play those however is appropriate for Old Stumpy, which is like, that sounds like a, that sounds like a folk band. Yeah, well, so it was. <laughs> and that's, you know, again, you get to a point where you have to ask yourself, like you said, what is the objective? If I am a band that calls myself, um, uh, let's say, seen? let's, <laughs> yeah. If I if I was a band, I'm even going to get more specific. If I called myself uh, Till Tuesday, um, there might be a particular vibe I'm bringing, right? Mm. Where or if I called myself uh, Jesse's Girl. Let's say right. it was a female band, right? It was Jesse's Girl. I probably am not a Rick Springfield cover band, but I'm probably doing that time frame. Right? Yeah, so that's another question, too. Like, the context part of it, of the, the band situation is a big piece of it. I'll go on. Yep. I'll, I'll interrupt you later. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I I lost what I was what I was gonna say. It was it's profound though, because it. But I think if you go on, I might I might pick it back up. Well, yeah. the 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 point I'm making here is that I'm I'm trying to make is that, um, it's con like you said, it's contextual. I I'm in a band that is almost predominantly classic country and new country. With me now, what's what's funny is I am the I am the balance, right? So I sing, like I said, I do Jesse's Girl. I do um, uh, Two Tickets to Paradise. I do the 
80s classics, right? And so I'm the one that sets the band in this balance where um, the, the country song that I do, I actually that. sing um, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. I sing the high part on that. And I sing um, uh, Keep Your Hands to Yourself. That's my country um, thing, which anybody that loves country music goes, that's not country. I know. Shut up. <laughs> I actually had this conversation at the old Stumpy show with uh, the uh, sound guy. We were kind of sitting and talking about the other band playing those songs. and Right. And so my point, my point being, I think probably makes itself. <clears throat> we, if we went out there and the, our regular lead singer, Tim, did uh, you know a song that was way outside? People would probably go, hmm, not really. What I'm expecting from that guy, I expect it from this guy. You know what I mean? So that juxtaposition um, is there. That said, I can never be as clean and clear and crisp as as uh, Rick Springfield doing Justice Girl vocally. And then, as raunchy and, you know, um, gritty as uh, um, Eddie Money. But I can bring you back by playing it as well as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I I have my thought back, too, by the way. So yeah, go. There is only one context I can think of where you have to play the songs the way that they originally came off the album. Uh Uh-huh. And that's tribute band. Right. That's it. That's it. So if you're sitting and even that, even that is subject to change because there are bands like Mac Sabbath where the lyrics are different and the, and the arrangements are different. Um, so that's kind of the point of all this is like these people that get really up in arms because you didn't nail it. Like as long as the performance is good, the audience isn't going to care and quite frankly, like, it's about whether you can sell it, whether you get involved in it. You know, like, if you're if you're just miming it and going through the motions, that's one thing. But if you really believe that song and you pick that cover because you feel good about it and you're like, I want to show you this. Like, that's a whole other thing than saying, like, when I was playing Margaritaville, which is like, I could give two shits about this song and, like, don't ever want to hear it again. And I'm kind of pissed off I'm playing it, but I'll play it. And I used to make it angry. Like, that's, that, I, I honestly, like, you can listen to the, the performances that I have on, on recording, and it's like, it's me being angry. You can tell. Um, it's like, I really don't want to do this. That's why I became all punk rock, because it was like, can we just get through this already? Yeah, so, um, it, it, Paul Pickley is is uh, is listening in. Th- Hi, Paul. Um, he, he asked, hey, an, he asked an interesting question. He says, um, let's talk about bands that play songs different live than in the studio. And right. I think a lot of people get really turned off by that today, but in my assessment, I mean, that's like, I got, I got a bonus, <laughs> you know, when I go to see yeah. live and it's different, I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. Um, especially if it's good, right? Like if it's bad, that's one thing. But if you go out like Led Zeppelin, they never played this shit like it was on the record. I mean, they no. might get the solo beats and stuff, but like for the most part, it was an exploration of the music that you'd already grown to love, and you didn't get mad. You were like, "Hell yeah, this is like a twenty-minute jam on a song I really like." Famously, listen to uh, the way that Jimmy Page brings in the solo on on um, "Stairway to Heaven," right? Mm-hmm. Um, he does not even start it. He does get there. He has different he rhythm parts live for it too. Yeah, and and it, um, his harmony is different. Like there's that song, and then actually the other one is "Dazed and Confused." I'm pretty sure "Dazed and Confused" wasn't a 25 minute song on the record. No, and and yeah. legend has it they did it for 45 minutes one night. You know, um, and and um, David Gilmore, "Comfortably Numb," that second solo. Every time I saw him, a, a recording of it. And I have several because I have several live performances. He did it differently. Yeah, he 
and he hated having to do the exact same thing night after night. I was just gonna say, so the same, so like the, the same thing goes there, right? Like, is some for some performers, it's just one spot in the show, or it's a couple spots in the show, but for other performers, they're doing it all night long, right? And I mean, like, if you went to a imagine going to a Prince show, and it was like written page all night long, you know what I mean? Like, that just was not gonna happen from that guy. And if you went no. there expecting that, you were going to be sorely disappointed. But I can't think of a right. single person who's ever told me, like, man, I really wish Prince would have just played shit like it was on the record. Like, no. I never heard anyone say that. No, when I saw Prince live, it was a, it was a experience. I mean, it was just, it was literally, well, we've talked about it before, performative art. I mean, it was just incredible on stage performances. But I have um, heard that about artists today. Like I've heard right. people say things like, "I really," and I'm just gonna make one up because I I can't think of any specific examples of people that have actually said this to me offhand. But like I know I've heard people say things like, "Man, Taylor Swift really overdid it on that one song," and it's like it's right. it was like way over the top than what it was in the studio. And I'm like, "Are you are you fucking nuts? Like, like what?" <laughs> um, I think. Um, uh, Paul said the reason he loves live music is no problem with changing. Um, yeah, uh, but it's got to be within character of the band too. So like, that's right. If somebody's going to do it, if a, if a Led Zeppelin tribute comes out and does a twenty minute version of of Dazed and Confused, like I think everybody it's expects fine, it to be like the Dazed and Confused version from you know, uh, right from, from Led Zeppelin. Live out. Um, that's right. If you came out and did it like Rush. I mean, people would be like, "What the fuck?" Is this? Right, right. But if uh, uh, let's say um, a, a Skinner tribute band did, uh, you know, a nine-minute solo at the end of Freebird, nobody's gonna go, "Oh, that sucked." They're gonna go, "Yeah!" Three guitar players doing yeah, their yeah. thing. The, in the moment, I can I can tell you this because I've been there. In the moment, you could screw up so badly, just just. Uh, you know, you, you're having fun, and then it's like you you go off like this, and then you kind of come back yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, and you, yeah. the you can have so much fun that, but but you're that's what they say when you you see an interview with a musician. They're like, yeah, we're standing on the edge. We know that anything could go wrong at any minute, but it's so fun and it's so exciting and it's just that feeling. I it's, think I think actually when it does go wrong, sometimes that's more fun than when it's going yeah. right. Like. Exactly, we'll, and you we'll talk about it that in the gig, We'll talk about that in the gig report tonight because there was a, there was yeah. a couple of moments in this last uh, open jam we went to that was like, oh my god. Yeah, good. I had the same it thing. Was it was really uh, I was gonna... But it, th that is what we talk about is um, uh, that, that you know if you're an ACDC tribute band and you do a um, whole lot of woman, right? You're not going to Rosie. A whole lot of Rosie. Thank you. I, I was singing one of the lines. Yeah, I know. Song. <laughs> I, I love that song. I love that song. It's a great song. And you're going to do that. You know, you're going to, and you're going to bring it down. And you're going to, and in the moment, you might milk it a little longer. Only once, and I've told this story before. No, only you can't once do it longer I, because they're going to count how many yeah, times. Only, <laughs> one time I had a guy. If, could you imagine if like, you held that, you held that, that course, an extra bar, like. I think the only person that might complain about that is a drummer. Yeah. I, I can, I, I got to tell tired. you, I, I literally had a person tell me at the end of the night, they were like, you know that part where you went, you did, 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 he goes, you're only supposed to do that four times. And I, I just, I looked at him like this. I was like, "What you should, what, what you should have said was call my agent." Like for the what? listeners out there, I just Who had this dumbfounded look on yeah, my face. Yeah, this near, like, like, are you serious? What the well, are you it, actually, I could sum it up. This is the phrase: "Well, bless your heart." <laughs> yes, yes, we're in the south. Bless your heart. Um, I was in New York at the time, so it's more like <laughs> "fuck you." Um, but yeah, it's just so funny to see this, um, you know, this thing. I I, I had another guy uh, once. We we did, um, you know, uh, I woke up this morning and I and we stopped and then everybody sings, "Had myself a beer," and then we go yeah. down. Nah, nah, nah. The, the guy goes, "Man, I know you guys did a great job," and I say, "I love it," but you know, when they play that part, you're not supposed to stop playing. 
and I'm it's assuming yes, these people are know. completely wasted when they're saying this shit to you. Because yes, yes, they were both wasted. But the the guitar player that came up to me and told me I did the ACDC thing wrong, I kind of had the feeling that he was that guy. You know, the, the old joke yeah. about the guitar players. You know. It, it takes six standing of them to it, change yeah. a light bulb. Oh, wait, he's One to change the, the light bulb. And he's the other standing ones to go. in the corner watching you with his arms folded because, like, yeah. he knows he could do a better job than you. I could have yeah. done it better. Yeah. The whole night, and that whole night, he was that guy. He was like, mm -hmm. and then he goes like this. He goes, you know what? You shouldn't be playing a Les Paul. And I said, why is that? He goes, you were playing mostly rhythm all night. I saw oh, I didn't Paul realize can't... that the rhythm so... switch on my Les Paul was for someone else. So so wait so wait you're telling me that that Les Pauls aren't supposed to be used for rhythm stuff? Holy yeah. shit! I kid Holy you not. Holy shit! You not? He, he was... would not like my EP because I used the PRS to get those Les Paul sounds throughout. <laughs> yeah, I I gotta tell you right now. So, oh I was my like, god! Really? really? Okay, okay. All right, I got you. I think we've done this one to death. D yep. Don't do dumb shit. You'll be fine. That's right. That's that's, that's how right. we're gonna end this. Um. So so Jim, you had a you had an interesting topic about what is our style, and that's you you had right. actually a loftier title for. I had to shorten it. So right. I'll let you start this off again. You're running the show tonight, man. Like I'm just I'm, I'm just an engineer you. tonight. That's all I am. Well, you know, I, you know, when it comes to what is your style. So I'm doing a little, I'm trying to make these little YouTube snippet videos um, that I'm putting together. And I'm taking video of, of um, YouTubers and playing their, their licks and then breaking their licks down and getting actually some good stuff by doing this. Tim Pierce, Robert Baker, um, uh, Wallerman, uh, Rhett Schull. Um, I, I sat down for like 40 minutes and just took a, um, a Rhett Shull solo that he just did, he did out of the blue, and I, I broke, I, I said, okay, this is how you play it, I tabbed it out, I broke it all the way down, and I was like, okay, what, what is this, because Rhett Shull plays like Rhett Shull, I mean, we give, we give Rhett Shull shit, he plays I hope like Rhett the Black Shull, Keys. I mean, he has a right. signature thing, but, but it's, there's a lot of Black Keys stuff and like yeah. that kind of thing in his playing for sure. Yeah, and I even I even point out in there where he screws up, but he's just having fun. He's showing he's showing off a fuzz pedal. It's actually in a Robert Baker video. Um, so I was able to take a ret shawl of Tim Pierce and a Robert Baker lick all from the same video. So sorry, Robert Baker, I'm stealing stealing your little thing there. Um, I don't think he copyrighted the the music in there since it's just some pentatonic noodling. But what's funny is each guy played their little snippet that they did with the same fuzz bases or fuzz pedals. I think they were actually using, um, what's the one that uh, JHS just redid? Um, very famous Octafuzz. Uh, An Octavia? Anyway, they, yeah, they, they each did a little piece of, of that thing. And they were like, how come people hate fuzz? You know, it was one of those videos. And uh, great video. Go check it out. Seriously, Robert Baker. But, um, and it, Rhett's thing was pretty funny because his was nice and they, they really went up on the guitar thing. So I was able to, I was able to tab it out in seconds. I just slowed it down and said, okay, his finger's right there, his finger's right there, his finger's right there. I was just able to do this. But um, uh, what I noticed was how he um, moved in and out and didn't do anything except for maybe two or three blue notes in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, yet it sounded musical for about, for most of it. And then you could tell it was noodling in some other parts. And I kind of wanted to break it down. But what I was getting at with this, what is your style thing is, when you play, um, and, you're, and you're about to go do your thing, this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. If you're playing a cover, you're going to play a cover. But what about if you're playing a song and somebody says, we're in blues, we're in A, we're playing, you know, one, four, five, turn around is G7. Sadly, I can probably play you all my licks and uh, <laughs> you can yeah. beat me really, really fast. And see, that's what I'm saying. Right. And that's great. And so 
what I love about um, uh, this is um, this goes to David Gilmore. Let's take one of the most famous players of all time. Um, I could do this. David Gilmore, um, Angus Young, Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan. There are certain things they did that told me during a solo, oh, that's, Steve, that's Angus Young. Yep, that's Stevie Ray Vaughan. That, you didn't have to tell me that that was Jimi Hendrix. I knew that was Jimi Hendrix. It wasn't somebody that was trying to beat Jimi Hendrix. That's Jimi Hendrix. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And same with David Gilmore. There were certain things, certain flourishes he did in his music that there's no way somebody else did it exactly the same way. You know what I mean? Yeah, unless they're unless they're really good at imitating it. Right. And even then it's even then you can sometimes tell them apart. Like I could tell Randy Hansen oh, from, from Jimi Hendrix most of the time. Right. Um but there's some that can leave you a little confused. You're like, I'm not well, really... I, I mean <laughs> But you take a guy like um um and I don't want to put anybody uh, put him down or or think anybody think that I'm putting him down. I think great guitar player, but um uh, Lenny Kravitz. When I listen to Lenny Kravitz, and I'm I'm a Lenny Kravitz fan. I have all of his albums. Um, <clears throat> and uh, but I could always tell Lenny Kravitz said, "I'm going to learn the Jimi Hendrix book of playing, and that's what I'm going to do." Yeah, that, I mean, he's definitely Hendrix descended. Yeah. Um I don't think he's completely Hendrix. I think there's some Page influence and stuff in there too, but. Yeah, and and there's some um, some other stuff, but for the most part, he said, "I'm going to learn from mm -hmm. the Hendrix playbook." So, if you were to examine your style as a player and say, "Okay, what is my style?" and put it out there and say, if somebody was say, "Hey, you guitar player, what what it, if you had to to describe your style to someone, what would you call it?" And I don't mean that you necessarily have to say it sounds like. You know, Bob Welch. I just mean, what? What is it? Um, when you when you bring it out, how how do you describe your music to someone else? Your style of playing. Um. So, all right. Um. For me specifically, if I was to, I would start with my influences. So just so you know, like the three biggest influences on me as a guitar player. Actually, we'll probably just expand it to five because there's really five. Um, outside of these five, I'm not really sure anybody else is all that prominent as like contributing to my development as a player. I would say the five guys that that influenced me the most, um, in no particular order, but it's probably like Robin Trower, um, Eddie Van Halen, uh, hey. Jimi Hendrix is in there, um, which Robin Trower and Jimi Hendrix are like one package right uh yep. richie blackmore and mm -hmm. um so that's that's the four there was one more yep. i was thinking of specifically um i have it a moment because i know there's one more if, if i think about it i'll we'll come back to it but but basically it's like those guys right so like J jim you you heard the one time that i had the the um the kemper profile pack the the evh profile pack and i was like hey I was like, take a listen to this, and I sent it to you. It was like long lost Van Halen recording, and yep. uh, yeah, I mean, I can pull that stuff out. Like I've been emulating that style for so long as a player that I have some of that stuff kind of down. Um, yep. And so, like another guy's probably Eric Johnson's in that list. Like I learned a lot of his stuff early on. Oh yeah, I'm still learning yeah. from him. Um, just like listening to licks and stealing stuff. But, like, realistically, I've never been a guy that... So this is why I say the influence thing more so um, in the beginning, because I think a lot of people tend to just, like, rip people's licks off, right? Like, oh, I'm going to learn all, you know, all of this album, so I'll know all the solo stuff that goes on. Like, that's not me. That's not how I operated. Um, I was more interested in, like, learning to play things that sounded like those people, playing in the style of. Um, right. And so, like specifically i can think of i can think of things that i do um which are even equipment related that is like very reminiscent of some of those players for example my preference for a univibe on my board comes from the yep. hendrix trower thing the um, right the style of drive i like is very similar to like you know the old marshall thing which is a blackmore and that's a that's a you know hendrix trower uh ingve ingve was the other one i left out i think um 
an Ingve thing. Like those guys were all Marshall guys, right? So like, um, I think actually every one of them is a Marshall guy. Now that I think about it, um, <laughs> which you know that's just seventies and eighties, right? Um, and but it's funny because like if you had to wait it now, what I'm doing with it right now, this this band I'm in, Dustin Unraveled, we finished our IP this weekend. Uh, it'll be off to mastering. I don't know when we're going to get it back. And as soon as I get it back, it'll probably be up on iTunes. And and um, I can imagine it'll be up on iTunes and uh, Spotify like next day. Well, I want to I want a physical copy. So you're going to yeah, figure so out we're gonna, we are going to make physical copies because um, I want that. I want that poster. I literally want that I, poster. I don't know how much. Yeah. J Jim has seen the album art. <laughs> Uh, the album art's really cool. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I'm a, um, what's the, what's the deal album that I told you about? What's, I forget which one it is. It's, it, I don't... it's uh, anyway, one of the deal albums was the color, was the art. Oh, Dio. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So we I, I like, don't want to, I don't want to spoil choice, anything. Right? Yes, like, I do it know. It was the color choice yeah. and we were like, we went kind of that color scheme. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I, I don't want. That's wanna... as far as I'm getting. I'm not going to say anymore, right? Because it's coming out and it's going to be really cool when it does. But if you were like, is, so, so the guys, I, awesome. so the guys <laughs> I just told you, right? They're all kind of bluesy, right? So like Trower, right. Hendrix, even Ingve's kind of bluesy at times. Um, which I know everything's like, oh, Shred God, but like he, he can, you know, he's got vibrato and stuff, and he can play a twelve bar, believe it or not. Um, yep. He never does, but but he could. And of course, Blackmore <laughs> is straight rock and roll blues, right? Um, I know, I know, Ingve can play a twelve bar because I've heard him. Go, go, seriously! If Ingve's in town, just go listen to the sound check. Buy a ticket and stand outside when they're doing the sound check, because yeah. that's when you're going to hear him do the thing that like people wished he would do, you know? Um, right on stage. Because I wouldn't pay to go see him the... again, but. Um, yeah. I've seen him twice and that's enough for me. I saw him I saw him once for free and then once I paid and the paid one was a longer concert and I was like, eh, okay. Um I saw him back when he was with uh what the heck was the name of the band that was his band? Um Steeler? Alcatraz? Alcatraz. Okay. Still with Alcatraz, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. so actually he was really good in Steeler. If you've never listened to the Steeler record that he did, uh, that's really good. Um <laughs> But just just to, to bring home the point here, like my stuff doesn't sound like that. I'm I, I can play blue stuff and actually I like really like playing bluesy stuff. I like playing 12 bars and and experimenting with blues because I think those chords are like home base for a lot of guitar players. And certainly are for yep. me. Um, and I like getting some of that into my solo work. But if you were to hear my records, like it sounds like docking or something, you know, it's like really heavy guitars. There's songs on this out, this EP that sound like, like smashing pumpkins. There's songs on here. That's not, that sound like, um, like I said, like docking and rat. Um, there's some songs on here that are really soulful. And, um, there are some that sound like John Petrucci, you know, like it's just a little bit, and I'm talking mostly tonally, but also a little bit of playing wise, because I'm going for sorts of vibes that I grew up around. And that's what's influenced me as a player. And I really don't think until this EP, I had a style specifically. Um, right. I've been writing music for the next set of tunes that we're going to start doing. Um, and I'm already like, realizing that some of the approaches I took on this EP are influencing my decisions going forward. Like that's a style choice. Now I'm like, I really like the way that came out and it was a very specific style of playing. How can we take it to the next level? And there's one thing in particular that I'm doing right now that like is very, I feel like it's like the next step for me. It's something that I don't hear a lot of people doing. I'm sure other people can do it because I can do it. Right. But, um, it's not something that I think people attempt because it's a little bit more difficult than just playing chords. Um, right. And uh, this is where three piece. I try to get as much going on as I can. Um, so I'm playing like basically, and I, and I can sort of just spill the beans. I'm, I'm playing rhythm and lead at the same time, literally at the same time. So like I'm playing the bass line of, of like whatever would be the, you know, the solid foundation for the chords and then I've got double stops or a lead line going on up top. And um, 
it takes an intense amount of practice to get like the basic riffs down. But once you do it, you're like, this is really cool if I do it this way, because it doesn't sound like anything else anybody's doing. Um, yep. And there are lots of songs in the 80s where they where guys did that, where they were like riding the low E or whatever. And then they would like play double stops on the, the D and A and stuff or D and G string. So it's similar. I, th- I think the way I'm doing it's a lot more complicated um, and probably unnecessarily so, but you right. know, it's, it keeps me busy and keeps me sane. So, um, but, but yeah, but I mean, like if I was to sum up who I was as a player in, in simple terms, I would say basically, I mean, I'm, I'm a blues inflected like eighties guitar freak. I like, I like all that hair metal crap. I like, I mean, I, and I say that cause I know we all think the lyric content in a loving way. is garbage. Right. Um, but there's so much good musicianship in that, in that material. And I'm also really into prog and that kind of stuff too. So, um, it's... you know, but, but my own playing tends to lend towards like, and I hate to say it, all those, all the sum of, of like my parts. And I've been talking about George Lynch on the show for, for the last six months, but like, kind of realizing it's all basically sounding like George Lynch at the end of the day. Cause he was the sum of some of those same parts like Richie Blackmore and Eddie Van Halen. So, yeah. Well, I, I, um, I think I'd have to sum myself up and just say, uh, seventies, you know, top 40 rock, uh, you know, that, that kiss bad company. Um, you know, I, I know it sounds like it's all over the place, but, my influences are definitely in playing stuff from uh, uh, bands like Pink Floyd, obviously, um, and uh, ACDC, um, I, but even Rush, uh, you know. That, um, and uh, there's a lot of music I liked, but I never played. Iron Maiden's one of them. I, I sing it, but I don't really play it, um, except on bass. Yeah. And so. You know, a lot of my influences, I would have to say, were in the that mid to late seventies into the eighties, um, classic rock. What someone would say was classic rock now, uh, Sam. That yeah, I mean, uh, all the guys I named are either dead or like right. in some state of retirement. <laughs> yeah, which I is kind of sad. I mean, there are there are modern players I relate to as well. So what it's worth but anyway yeah i don't i don't have any modern players i relate to none so, um so like for me the modern guys would be like josh smith and like um yep. the other one's great uh greg cock um yeah and there are others i love those two come to mind you know i love greg cox music and i love josh smith's music and um who else uh um, there's a couple of other guys you've mentioned uh in the past that we both listen to um but they're not influences. Right, exactly. They're contemporaries. I right. don't look at I'm not sitting around trying to steal I, I and I have copped a few Josh Smith licks, but I'm not like yeah. sitting around like trying to become Josh Smith. I mean that's just Well, that's why I thought it would be interesting at this to, point. <laughs> right, right. I thought it would be that's why I thought it would be interesting to grab some YouTuber licks and just go, well this is, you know, this is the video, I'll give them the about Thing and say, okay, this is this is kind of what they were doing in there, because mm. um, sometimes they're not doing it; they're doing it for a pedal demo, yeah. you know, or they're doing it for a, a guitar demo or an amp demo or whatever. Right. And so they're not trying to teach you anything, but there's a teachable moment in it. There's a listenable, interesting moment because when it, this is the thing I find that when I watch YouTubers that are teaching and then they're demoing. The difference in the teaching and demoing is in the teaching they're trying too hard sometimes, or at least a little harder, to ever Tim Pierce. Tim Pierce is always Tim Pierce. I've never seen Tim Pierce not be Tim Pierce. But um most of the other uh, guys, it's like, okay, I'm gonna take a 12 bar blues, I'm gonna play a you know a solo over it, and this is what I do. It's well, like not really, because I've listened to your demo stuff, yeah. and that's not what you do in the moment. But some of that is, but some of that is like them trying to pull the curtain back, and be like, right. "This is the way you're supposed to approach this as a correct. fundamental piece." Of that it. that is correct, but not necessarily the, the way biggest, I approach it. 
That's right, which is a big difference between like like if you were to go to I was talking to a friend of mine tonight who was actually musically related. Um yeah, we were we were pulling this from Matt is um if you were to go to uh the camp of your favorite baseball team, um uh -huh. preseason camp, you'd see the hitters hitting off tees and the pitchers pitching to um nets and you know, so on and so forth. And you go, This isn't baseball. They don't. They don't play tee ball. Um, actually, they do. And they practice hitting a ball at different angles because they want the ball to to do different things. It's a different fundamental, and that's exactly what we're talking about. You go to a football camp; it's a fundamental. Um, and same thing with guitar. They're teaching us fundamentals. That's why I said it's interesting to see what they do in the moment. Versus right. what they do as a teaching moment. Right. That's all I was, you know. And I thought it would be interesting to break down some of that and look at it. And I thought it when you're when you're when you're um, uh, when your music comes out, your EP, I think it'd be interesting to take some of the some of the pull back the curtain on some of that stuff. Go, okay, this is what I did. I'd love for you to like try to figure some of it and not because I th don't think you will be able to, but I would love, th here's my thought process, not the solos, some of the right. riffs. Um, oh, okay. I yeah, would love for might, you to like yeah. pull a couple of them apart because there's yeah. one of them in particular that like, I think a lot of people would find it tough as nails to play, but it's really like, for me, I play it so much. It's like easy now at this point, but, right. it, but it's like for me, when I'm writing a song, and if I want, you know, it, I think I think the ultimate display of like musician badassness is to make the verse and the chorus fucking awful hard to play. Like the solo is right. one thing, right? Because everybody knows that's your personality, and you know, to be able to cop somebody's personality is like a whole other thing. But if yeah. you can like put a rhythm part together that's just nasty hard to play, um, but sounds great. I right. think that's like the ultimate test. And I have definitely run across some, some shit where it's like, how the hell do you even approach that? Um, Correct. Classic example would be somebody like Frank Ambali. Like anything that guy does oh, is just geez. insane. Like it's, it's only Frank plays that way. I mean, you're not yep. going to see anybody else play that way. And, and, and Absolutely. It, I had a conversation with a uh, show listener, Mike Mir about this. Cause I was joking that I was going to learn one of his songs and I actually really thought about it. Cause I was like, it, it would be a workout, right? Like it totally would be, but I couldn't find one that like, I felt strong enough about from a musician perspective of like enjoying the music uh, enough for me to like learn it. But what I was, what I was thinking about was like, um, the fact that I could look at the tab for his music and know it was just, like there was no way because like when you see people doing sweet picking in reverse and you can see it in the tab you're like oh fuck this like <laughs> you know that's just like it's just not worth it dude like i i mean he's he's honed that that is what he does right and right. that's what i'm that's what i'm getting at is like if you can write a rhythm part that is like so ridiculous that it's hard to emulate i think you've nailed it and I think there yep. might be a couple of places on this one that the, there are particular rhythm parts that are like, what are you, Spider-Man? Like, how the hell did you pull that off? Because yeah, there's, yeah. there's stretches and there's also like inverted shapes, you know, so like everybody sort of um, the the the. Uh, so if you pick a picture of C cowboy chord, the shape that your hand makes where you put the ring finger up top, right? And some people actually do the fingering differently, but if you put the finger up top that goes on the, the A string, um, yep. you're forming an, like an inverted angle, right? So it goes up. Right. Um, if you have a shape that goes the other way, things become slightly harder. And yep. if you do, if you go down, you have an angle like that, and then you, the next note is up, then it gets even more difficult. And then yep. you put in some slides and some like you have to carry the same root note, but there's some slides in it because it's really the only way to finger it. Then things start getting tougher. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm doing now. Like, that's where I'm like, I think it would be really fun to have you take apart some of the, some of that music. Cause, cause it would be yeah. interesting. It would be interesting to get like how somebody who's never seen me perform it would do right. it. 
And yeah. Yep. That if it's sweet picking, you can you can bet it'll there, take me. <laughs> there's no sweet. There's no sweeping on this album. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Maybe that in would, some, maybe yeah, in some yeah. solo, but like for the most part, there's yeah. no sweeping. If least. you're talking about the um, yeah, if you're talking about the verse and the and the chorus, I'll take that. Yeah, part. yeah. Ooh, I'm not going to ask you to figure out one of my solos because I have to figure out my solos, and I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I can't imagine being the guy, and we're gonna. That's what we're. We can slide right into the next part because that's as, this is what we're getting into. Is can you succeed as a musician um, and have at least some modicum of success? Is that how you spe- say it, modicum? Yeah, um, level. modicum, modicum. Yeah, level is an easier. You know, some yeah, some even level of success today as musician. As David has pointed out, they're releasing a new EP, which I've I've gotten a chance to. Um, you've heard some you of the know, mixes and stuff to, that are coming out. Yep, I haven't sent you everything. Mixes. There's only five songs. Right. I think you've heard like three of them. Yeah, and um, I. I had the chance to see the incredible artwork. Like you said, it came from a Dokken album. No, it was Dio. Um, Dio. Or Dio, sorry. Dio album that, that I don't want to name it because if I name it... Then everybody's going to know what the colors are going to look like. <laughs> yeah. And it just it just blew me away. I, I want to say a joke about it, and I can't even say that. Mm. Um, so I'm just going to shut up. But I, it, and it, when I say a joke, I mean a, a, like a hint. I don't even want to give that hint. So um, ju- let's just say I said to something to David. I'm not gonna say what it said, but I saw it and I go, I go, this is this is awesome. I want that. I want it as a poster. I really, literally want that as a poster. We're not in Kansas. I mean, that's, that's yeah. Basically... That's what I said. We're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll just leave it Kansas, at that. Kansas it's, had it's... some bra- some great fucking album covers. Let me tell you. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And anyway. there were some incredible album covers. And so, um, point is. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the music in its final form, um, you know, and uh, getting myself a physical copy. And like I said, if it's all possible, get a poster of the um, of the artwork because it's just great. And I couldn't believe how you did it. You can tell people how you got that. That don't tell them what it is, but tell them how you got it. My um, uh, my co-writer, which I call him my co-writer right now because it's really just the two of us in this band, right? He's like the bass player and singer. He um. He reached out to uh, Tony. Reached out to a guy on Fiverr, and we just like honestly, we sat down for twenty minutes one one afternoon and just looked through Fiverr, and we're like, we like this guy's art. I like this guy's art. And I like this guy's art. And we circled a couple, and Tony's like, well, I'm paying for this because because you're doing the other thing. So he's like, I'll just uh, I'll I'll retain somebody. And then we kind of before we even retained him, we kind of went back and forth on like concepts or what it should be and then we just sent him a thing and said like this is what we want and then the first thing we got back was so good that that tony and i had we, we paid for like a service where we could get like two or three revisions and tony and i kind of went back and forth and we were like do we even want a second revision <laughs> and then we got a second revision and then we got a third revision and the guy gave us a fourth and a fifth and the stupid part was four and five were literally the same thing but we got to pick between the two of them and we took number four, I think, which is like really, really close to number one. So it, it, the guy just nailed it. That's basically what it, what it boiled down to. Um, that reminds me of the story of when like Storm Thurg- Storm Ferguson brought in the you know the stuff for Pink Floyd's artwork. Yeah, and it was uh, it was the Dark Side of the Moon. And he said these, are, and they all went that one. You know, yeah, it, it's that that story of of. You know, I don't know if musicians are doing that these days because it seems like a lot of them are so. Yeah, who cares what the artwork looks like our, anymore? Our so like this is really funny, and I want to share this. This is an aside to our band because I don't. I wouldn't. I, we're going to talk about measuring success here in a minute, but um, our process and like all of the different things that we've gone through, there have been so many happy accidents like this as we've moved through this process. I can't help but wonder like what cosmic forces are sort of aligning that are like directing this path. And I'm not a, I'm not an especially spiritual person. So like for me, this is like, there's just too many little things that are aligning. Like we got hooked up with the right engineer producer to pull this off at an affordable price. That sounds good. I mean, it sounds like a vintage record um, with modern instrumentation and it has like, 
we just go, we've just gone down the right goddamn path. Right. And like, it's just happened that all of these things are just sort of coming together at the right time. The end of right. COVID, like, I, I and well, we all know COVID's not over, but like the end of the regulations and the fact that like, when then we were able to go into the studio right away and then, you know, just like kind of working through all these problems and it was all just kind of like coming to, you know, coming to an impasse altogether. Um, I was getting really frustrated in the studio before I got, uh, before I got COVID because we were, we did a bunch of rework. Like we did one mix like four times, five times. And, um, and I spoke about how, why that is. You can go back and listen to previous episodes on that. Um, but, uh, we ended up, we ended up doing a song like four or five times. And I just kind of like, I was really burnt out on it and I got COVID and I was out of the studio for like a week and a half or whatever. We went back to the studio and like, we just plowed through the last couple songs. It was like, yep. no big deal. Now I, it was like, everything had just changed. Like it was just, this is the way it was supposed to be. And you were approaching this at the wrong time. So this, so the universe stepped in and, and realigned this. Um, and so now here we are with the album artwork and that's being, you know, just handled expeditiously. Um, I got, I, I sort of know what the studio bill is going to be and it's, not bad at all like it's frankly a lot lower than i was anticipating in fact i thought my portion was going to be the whole bill um which ends up being half of that so i'm like yes uh that that's great too and then like there's all these other professional level conversations that are going on on the side with regards to it so i have i like i have nothing negative to say about it um sometimes things just go your way you know and that's what it feels yeah. like it's that's how things feel right now anyway um, yeah, that's awesome. And so as far as measuring success, like if we're talking about, all right, so I think most people, when they say measuring success, they get this image of like a musician and I don't care if it's a guitar player or whatever other musician who does nothing but gig and, and or studio work and write music and record music and whatever. Um, and that pays his bills, right? right. Like that pays all his bills. Now, Let's let's take a step back and let's because because like I want to share from the perspective of somebody who lives in a major city, what that looks like. So here you're going to have a tough time living as a single individual for any less than fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, A real tough time, because especially as a musician, because we have costs, right? You need medical insurance. You got to have a reasonable car you have to have a place to live and you're not getting a, an apartment or a condo around here that you can rent for any less than 1200 a month now. Um, not where you'd want to live. And yeah, so we all know that musicians tend to live in like cheaper places too. And like, that's a thing, but um, there just aren't $800 apartments anymore. It's just not something that exists. Um, so cars and all that stuff like you think about the amount of money that's required to sustain that that career choice and like you put it in the math right so like let's assume the average gig is 300 bucks um and you're and you're getting paid a hundred dollars out of that 300 right because you got a trio right so you would have to gig how many days a year to reach that fifty thousand dollar mark i mean do the math it's not good <laughs> it's 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 not easy. If you made all three hundred dollars, you'd have to have one hundred and sixty-seven yeah. gigs. You'd have to gig half the year. a year. That is uh, that, and now so you can't do it as a bar. <laughs> that all I'm pointing out is you can't do it as a bar musician. No, you have to come up with other means and ways. If you were, if you now let's 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 step back, take a step back, Jim. What if you were in a tribute band that gigs once a week, which is rare, um, yep. for a thousand dollars a show? Yeah. So you would make fifty two thousand dollars a year if right. you did it every week. You would fall yep. short of the fifty thousand dollar mark. So you still right. need some sort of alternative income because let's face it, you're not going to be able to gig all fifty two weeks of the year. Um, right. Which means you have to come up with something else. You know, yeah. So. Um, that's why actually when you pro propose this conversation, um, I wanted to step back for a second and I wanted to say, okay, so 
that's not the only income stream that you, you can have as a musician. And I'm not just talking about like teaching, like everybody knows you can teach lessons. Right. And I know a lot right. of the, um, a lot, a lot of the local guys that are, that are gigging and doing two gigs most days. Cause, cause there are, it's so like we, the drummer we tried to engage, he's doing two and three gigs most days and he's willing to stack up three gigs on a day. So, uh, if you think about that, and he's making $100 or $150 a gig, maybe $200 a gig. Like, he's hitting that mark, right? Like, he's almost there if he's not. Um, because it would be easy for him to get that 163 gigs a year if he's doing two a day. Um, so, uh, I know a lot of the other guys that are jobbing around here are also teaching. Um, and it's usually private lessons out of their house instead of the overhead of a... Of a um, um, a music store right? right and then of course we know that the guys that are like at the b tier that are probably making right around a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars a year they're um teaching through youtube or they've got a youtube channel right that's helping drive um their career and then they might also have a blog or something and um they do solo dates and they have might play with multiple bands and they probably do studio sessions and on addition to that, if they're doing originals, they're also getting mailbox money, which has helped supplement that in income. So once you get to that tier, it's it's not as critical that you have that second tier of income. Um, but like when you're on that, when you're in the, the beginning part of this, um, a lot of people seem to think that like you can just, you can live for $20,000 a year and you just, you know, you'll live with a buddy and like I know people who've tried to do that and it doesn't work number one, but I always laugh because I'm like, there are so many musician adjacent careers that are not only accepting of you being a musician, but also wouldn't, in, would inform your abilities as a musician. So like, think about this, become a, some sort of audio engineer for somebody because they are needed in other skills. Um, I know I have a friend who does multimedia design for for um uh for a um a museum and they need audio engineering skills or um I know people who like we all know that people build effects pedals that we know people who build amplifiers like that's been a big topic on this show um there are all kinds of music adjacent jobs uh, if you want to go into legal track, you can become uh, a copywriter or, you know, like there's a ton of uh, stuff there um, on, the, on the legal side of it. But there's also just so many musician services. Get a job working as um, working in like a like a uh, what do they call it? Um, the the ear doctor, uh, audiologist, yeah. you work for an audiologist. Like, work as a receptionist in an audiologist office. You'll learn tons of shit about hearing, and that's useful um, right. to, to your to your musician track. These are, they, they, my, my point is, um, and you can even go back and you can look at professional players. George Lynch talks about working while he was, while he was doing the first docking record and after the first docking record. Um, he got fired from, from Ozzy Osbourne's band because he, before, um, and I believe that was when uh, Jakey Lee came in. He got fired because he had short hair. Because he had a day job where he yeah. was not allowed to have long hair. Um, So, and that was like, you know, he's already making the docking record at that point. Like, what the hell? Um, So keep that in mind. Like, this is a, this is a time period. This is a, a, a time period specific thing where we're living right now where there's not enough money to go around for musicians. The gigs aren't good enough for you to pay the bills of gigs. So if you think that's how you're going to survive as a musician, I'm here to tell you, you can't succeed that way, but there are plenty of musician adjacent careers. Um, even just a live sound company or go to, you know, like I, I, I can't, I can't stress to you this. Like people think that, that um, this has not been a portable skill set for me. And I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do my current job if I had not learned how to record music. Um, I do, I do uh, public speaking recordings and stuff for work now. And I'm actually an IT guy by trade. 
And I probably wouldn't know enough about computers if I hadn't been into computers because I was recording with them. Right. So that's a, that's a whole other huge part of that, right? It's like, and that's another musician adjacent career. You want to sharpen your brain and get it to where like you can think through the complicated problems of, you know, how to navigate chord progressions. I suck at it, but it's, but it's something that like, I'm sure I'm probably better than some people because of my, my brain works the same way when I'm doing, when I'm doing software design. I mean, that's, I have to exercise the same parts. Right. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, so, uh, I think, I think it can be done. Um, I see it personally. I don't, I don't do it personally, but I see it personally. Um, I know people that that's all they do for a living here in uh, southeastern Virginia um, is to be a musician. And uh, it's giving lessons, like you said. Um, it's, you know, uh, going to churches. Um, church gigs but are it, great. You know, a yeah, lot of people put down a church musician. But it's not just gigging. It, no. can't, it can't be. You can't sustain no. yourself on that anymore. No, and, and that's what I was just about to say. So, um, when I say the church, I don't mean that they just gig at the church. They're doing stuff for yeah. the church. So, somebody's got to mow the lawns, paint the walls, wash the toilets. Right. Um, it, you know, and not all of it is standing up on that stage playing ambient chords for, you know, an hour and a half you, or two you know, hours. Actually, turning. The, and in a church situation, I never even thought about this, but I'm sure the church is tickled to death to have what people see as the urchin of society working for the church. Because right. we, we, let's face it, musicians get a bad rap. What do people think when That's they right. see musicians? They think drug addicts. They think drunk. They don't think professional. They don't think you right. know. Uh, they don't think somebody who conforms and 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 works within the confines of society. They think about that guy that's like on this flight of fancy doing his own thing. Or that's right. You know, it's absolutely right. Um, and you can take part in just about anything. Um, the fact is that uh, I just went and saw um, a band retire over the weekend. A group of guys that that are retiring the band because some of the band members are they're calling it quits. Yeah, they're ready this to band, hang it up. Yep. This band started in nineteen sixty seven. So they've been musicians um in this area. Um most of them just professional musicians in this area since the sixties. So it can be done, and it's not something new, and it doesn't have to be YouTube, Twitter, TikTok. I don't see a future in TikTok musicianship. I see a future maybe coming from becoming a uh, a TikTok musician. Yeah, I don't see a future so, in it. There's not enough money in the advertising. I wouldn't see that. As... You know, it's funny you say that. Mateo Sasato is an Instagram. He is, but that's different. But but he's no, but so it's it's only a minute. It's one minute versus if you're verified on TikTok, you get a minute too. Um, I know this. Oh really? I, I didn't know up. that. I had to look this up the other day. Most people only watch 15 seconds on TikTok because it brainwashes yeah. you. But um, yeah. you can get verified and then you can do one minute videos. I I believe it is. But so here's but, the here's the issue with the TikTok thing though. Is like, you, number one, nobody's doing that, getting ad revenue, and then living off of that. And that that's true of Instagram too. They're doing that, and then that's getting them other work, or they already have other work. That's right. And Matteo Sassato is a is a prime example of right. that. Incredible musician, um, but not. Um, he got work because of that, and that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying you don't leave it out just because it doesn't give you instant stream right. revenue. It's a it's, way, it's just, like a business card. Right, right. I mean, I don't have an Instagram because I'm a good-looking guy who's looking to... And that was the other part of it, and that was what I was going to get at, is the everyday, everyday Joe or Josephine um, or Joe Josephine can do what... Um, can do the things to become a musician that can make a living out of music. Yeah, that was um that's something that like I've been struggling with is the idea that 
yeah, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of expertise. Like I can play pretty well. Um, but that, that next step, like the people that are above me is like whole other level, whole other world. And the, the bridging that gap, figuring out how to get there is just kind of mind blowing. Like if I, I got to be honest with you, this is me giving this to you live over YouTube. If I was you, you're what, 30, 37, 37, okay. 37 years old. If I was 37 again, I had a shot. The the things I just mentioned, Instagram, TikTok, um, what's the other one? Uh, not Facebook. Um, the other little one. Um, mm -hmm. YouTube Shorts, and there's one other one. It's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube Shorts. Yeah, and Tumblr other. and you know, all the other yeah. stuff, right? Oh, doesn't matter. Point is, you have the you have the talent. Yeah, I mean, I'm keenly aware. So, so, but my gaps are like I I have massive mm -hmm. gaps, and those gaps are things that are going to require a massive amount of man hours to fill in. And mm -hmm. it's how do I get that? Part of the reason why I left old Stumpy, right? Like, how do I get those man hours in? Because I really right. and I've got a band going now, but it's like shit. I have I need like hours and hours to woodshed. To get to a That's point it. where I can even be like comparable to even some of the some of the middle tier guys that are around here, but you could you could become that modicum, and then become that bigger success. When you look at uh, when I look at the landscape of music now, I I am for the first time in what year is this? Okay, almost forty years writing original music which I, I never thought I'd do again. Yeah. I literally said a few years ago, I have zero. Man. I think I said it on this show. <laughs> it's therapeutic, man. Yes, you have, you have said that on this show that you would never write original music. And uh, I have a friend now who's the co-guitar player in my band who's pulling it out of me. Yeah, he's like, get and, up your ass and do this. And I'm reminded of, you know, there's a scene in uh, um, Harry Potter when they go to this, like, pot... And they're pulling threads. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying to figure memories. out what house they're in, yeah. Yeah. And and that is what I feel like he's doing to me. It's like he's pulling this thread of stuff that I didn't even know was there coming out of my head. And um, for me, that's the... I'm like, you know, I could write a song. I only need mailbox money for one song. You yeah, know? I mean, I wouldn't and, get I wouldn't get too fancy on dreams, but like no, but I'm just saying that that I could so many benefits to doing it. That's like why right. not? And and it's the the other side of it is therapeutically leaving a mm -hmm. a mark, leaving even if I only last a few more years, leaving the the um you know the the legacy of that song. I watched uh -huh. that band last night, and I'm like. These guys, I could tell why they were retiring. Um, but I also said, they've got a legacy. Yeah. They have a record, and their record had some, you know, success, and they've done, you know. Do you remember? They have some fans. There were people there, you would not believe the number of people, video and, and everything. I was like, this place is packed. So, so and it, and what we're talking about is investing in yourself, right? Like that's what we're yeah. talking about here. So that's right. Um, if you're going to do the Instagram thing, you're spending your time mm -hmm. so that you can produce a product that might actually produce a return by getting you work, right? Or right. something of that nature. And so like for me, this comes back to a conversation we had with Danny Rabin. Um, and actually, I think it may not have actually made it on this show. I think we might have actually had this conversation before the show, but I believe it did come up on the show where he said, if you want to get, if you want to make something happen, pay the musicians. And it, yeah. it, like from, from this perspective, we're doing this EP and we elected to have, pay somebody to mix it. And we elected to, you know, we're going through these steps of realizing like, and it's my, my co-writer, Tony, has already gone through these steps. He's older than I am. He's been doing this a lot longer. He's right. done, I think, seven or eight um, albums of his own music. And he's kind of like, he's I, I he's a creative individual. He doesn't want to do covers. Like, 
to the point where we were going to pad out our set with covers, but now we're talking about not doing that. Um, and he's gone down that path where it's like, you got to invest in yourself. You have to like mm -hmm. put the money. If you want to get a return on anything, if you want to yep. take a chance, how are you going to take that chance? Are you going to take a chance with an album your buddy mixed in his closet? That right. Really, who doesn't really know anything about this? Or do you, are you going to take a chance with a guy that like has a track record and has done 40 records or 50 records yep. for people in our area and then another 50 records before he was here? Um, and, you know, that's kind of like where I'm at, where it's like I'm I'm through with doing the the I'm going to do this out of my garage thing. And like I'm I if I'm gonna do anything serious, or I'm gonna spend my time on it. It's also worth my money. Um, That's right. And I'll invest in my future. Like I'll invest in when I buy gear. I don't see gear as like a toy. That's investing in my in my craft, right? Like, I you really think I want to spend the, what I spent on that bareface cabinet? I mean, right? It was really expensive. Um. <laughs> for, Um, and do, do you think I really want to, do you think I, I, I was just saying that I, that was just, that was ASMR. Um, I was, <laughs> I have nothing to hide. Like you can, you can go find yeah. out how much I paid for it. Cause I didn't even ask to like get a discount or anything. Um, it's one of those whole things where if, if it's worth doing and I'm going to, if I'm going to gamble, I'm going to bet on myself. Um, and I think everybody, if we took that approach a little bit more and like put it a little bit further forward, I think we would know instantly who the people are who really have, you know, who who feel strongly about what they do and the people that are in it for the fun of it. And there's nothing wrong with being in it for the fun of it. I know right. local cover bands who play and they don't they don't want to invest time in, in making their sound good. They don't want to invest time in like having a decent PA. They don't want to invest time yep. in um um or, or they or they only gig at places that have house PAs, which that's another thing. I know a couple. I actually know some bands that are like that, but we also I also know people who they have to pay the bills, and because they're a musician, because they're a musician, it's their primary income. For them, paying the bills is so present in their life that they can't actually make the decision to go and do the music they could do. Right, that would probably not only pay the bills but pay them big dividends. Because there's yep. one person in particular I'm thinking of, and and people local know me, um, probably know who that is, because you probably know them too. I'm sure you've seen them before. They're only they only got like five bands, right? But I just every time I see them, I'm amazed that th how the hell does this person not have a deal? Like great performer, uh, wonderful vocals, decent guitar playing, good on drums, good on bass. Like understand has a very thorough understanding of music, has really really good uh, taste. Um, they got chops to spare on all these instruments. That's why I'm like, what the hell? How is that? That that's part of the reason why I'm like I'm probably never gonna get there because I'm looking at other people that are better than me. They're stuck, right? And it's because they can't invest in their future. That's what I was gonna say. And it sucks. And I wish like, look, I'm the kind of guy that would that would pull the Van Halen thing. Where if if for some miracle of God I got the deal right, like I'd be like, hey, look, there's this dude that I came up with, or that I knew like coming up, like this is a guy you just need to go sign this son of a bitch because he's got more talent than I do. He's really a yeah. better musician than I am, and quite frankly, like he's gonna make you a lot of money if you give him an advance. Right. Um, there I wouldn't bet on most people I know that way, but there there's like two people I know specifically where I'd be like, bet on that guy. Cause, cause yep. you know, that's, that's a sure thing. Like why the hell hasn't anybody already done it? Um, so for what it's worth, you know? Yep. So my, uh, we're, we're going to have to talk about you writing original music and how you're going to, what's your plan and stuff with all that is. And cause, uh, yep. and that could be a sidebar conversation if you want it to be, but, um, I can help you get, your head around that. Um, actually, uh, if you're listening to the show, you know, I've gone down the path of using Presonus studio one. Um, and I gotta be honest with you. 
Like, I am so head over heels with that dog compared to Cubase and Pro Tools and even Reaper at this point. Um, I don't see myself migrating away from it anytime soon. Uh, there's nice. a lot of features in there that are worth it, in my opinion. So let let's are we done with this topic? Or you got stuff you want to add? Because we're on. To no, the that was report. that was. We hit on everything that uh, I wanted to hit on. All right, gig report. I'll go first this week. Uh, I did open jam and Pollyanna. It's, it's a typical gig report, right? I didn't record video this time. Uh, I wanted to give my my wife a break because um, usually she's the one running the camera. Um, so we went to um, we went to Pollyanna. And um, we were there early. Uh, again, it was kind of a like pseudo open mic thing. People were showing up mm -hmm. and they were getting on stage first because they were like an open mic act instead of the regular performer. So I didn't get on stage until like late. It was like 9.30, it's 10 o'clock. It's not really that late, but when last call is like 11, 11.30, that's when you're like, uh, what the hell? Um, so I played with a, uh, a guy who actually listens to the show. Um, which means I have to censor myself a bit. No, it was, so what actually, I, we don't have to censor ourselves. We play together a lot and actually it's usually pretty good, but we just kind of fell apart. It was like a crash and burn scenario. And I was a little bummed when I got off stage, but I was kind of like, I had a good time with it, right? So I, I, I want to like sort of give a little bit of breakdown of how things went. Um, he calls the first two, well, we're, we're, we're sound checking, right? So, Guy comes over and he has me play my guitar. Uh, Sam host comes over and has me play my guitar. So I play my guitar and then uh, he says, okay, that's good. And then he moves on to the next guy and the next guy is like way louder than me. And he says, that's good. So I'm like, well, what the fuck? So I reach down and I grab my, my master volume on the amp one and turn it up a little bit. Um, anyway, he goes to the acoustic guitar player, singer, who's band leader. I've been on stage with him dozens of times. Um, he goes, um, you know, let me hear your acoustic guitar plays it apparently it sounds fine through the mains but i had a little bit of a panic moment because i'm like i can't hear shit through the monitor and if you got a loud electric guitar next to you and the monitor like it's just gonna be obnoxious right um so i was like okay uh i'm getting all kinds of alerts i need to mute discord for a second um <laughs> yeah i don't know who's messaging me right now um anyway so i'm getting i'm uh i'm like this is going to be a problem because i'm not going to be able to hear the acoustic guitar so that actually is exactly what happened all right so oh this is actually show related so the messages i was getting uh a certain a certain show listener got a giggity pedal and it showed up, and then he was sending me the giggity, as well as, you know, obviously the guy from Family Guy doing the giggity. Um, oh, I, I muted you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't say anything, Jim. You've been cut off for a minute. <laughs> I I muted both discords. I, yeah, you need the other one. Here, hang on. All right, now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Okay. Right. So I, um, I, I was... Uh... Um, speaking of your your thing, just to take it for a quick aside, there's a um, there's a fart pedal that uh, has been uh, that has a Kickstarter, and oh yeah, I I gotta be honest, don't but I would not recommend the pedal for anyone looking for anything musical, not even as musical as the Miko Siko or whatever the the, yeah, the, the Miko the Miku. Miku, right? Not even as musical as that. It's a million miles from musical. All it does is make fart noises. Yeah, it's basically like a sampler. You know, like a... random fart noises. Yeah. And it's got a wet and a dry <laughs> Oh my god. I thought uh, I was gonna uh, piss my pants listening to Oh my god. <laughs> Just flick that on in the middle of a set. If you got if you got a chance, you know who, I don't I don't care if you put money into it. Do you know who would actually like, get use out of that? What? Trent Reznor. Who? Oh yeah, yeah. That that guy would. <laughs> I I gotta be honest. I I want a Miku uh, just to have it. Yeah, but they're too damn I'm expensive, not man. Freaking money. Yeah, they're um, crazy expensive now. Like five hundred to seven hundred dollars. Good like, lord, you've got to. Kid. You know they could make a bazillion dollars just re-putting that. If they out. still have the rights, because Miku is actually a character in 
in uh, a Japanese thing. So they right, they, 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 Miku. yeah, Hatsune right. Miku, right. So I, um, I I don't know. They might be able to reissue it. It depends on where the rights are at. Right, and that's what I'm saying. If they still have the ability to put that out, I would so do that. With Digitech's new owners, I would not be surprised if that doesn't actually happen. I'd love to um, see it. I I'd be I'd be day one order. I would order one right away. All right. So anyway. Anyway, go ahead. Yep. Sorry. So monitors aren't working. I can't yep. hear the acoustic guitar. I can't hear the vocal. He has him to sound check. I can hear him through the mains, but I cannot hear him through the monitor. And then uh, it was me and Tony actually were on stage. So he's playing bass. So he's on the far side of the stage. I'm on the left side of the stage, like really far left, um, which would be stage right. And of course, the drums are behind me. And uh, there's a guy between us, or two guys between us, acoustic guitar player on Tony's side. And then on my side, there's the other guitar players, extremely loud. Um, so I don't know how he got away with the sound check with his volume being where it was. Uh, and I'm not even going to, I just don't care at this point. I have a feeling what happens is the tanks that are next to me, because um, when I goosed my volume, I should have been plenty loud. I think the tanks that are next to me, because there's like these two uh, distillery tanks, because it's, it's a brewery. Um I think the sound like echoes around them on the inside yep. and I lose some of my, my volume out to the audience. Cause I know I've had bigger problems when I'm further away from the drums. So for what it's worth, I think that's, that's a big part of that. Anyway, um, hopefully this new cab will solve that problem. Um, so we get to playing. He wants to play uh, what I got from sublime. So that's easy. D and G right. So first I'm playing like cowboy chords and then I'm playing bar chords and I'm hearing the guy next to me is also playing bar chords. And I'm like, all right, screw it. Uh, I will literally just play the D shape and then hammer on the notes to turn it into hammer on and pull off the notes to turn it into a G. <laughs> Excuse me. So I was actually only playing three notes for the chords uh, for most of the tune, but we were able to get through that because it was real simple and the, the drummer was basically car carrying it. And um, so then we got to the next tune and I forgot what he wanted to play, but it was a disaster. Uh, it was a hot mess. And I have no idea uh, how we got through it. And then we played. Um, it wasn't even like nobody. It wasn't that people didn't know the chords. I actually knew because I played the, with the guy a bunch of times. I knew all four songs. And we bombed the last three. Um, and it was because, so like, we were playing Superstition. We get halfway through a verse, and then somebody starts playing the chorus. And the the singer starts doing the chorus, and we're going, oh shit. I'm going, oh shit. Like, what are we doing now? And I sort of look over at Tony, and I'm looking over at, at VJ the drummer, and I'm like, what the hell? You know, like, and they're just kind of like, I don't know. And I'm like, all right, well. And the guy next to me, I get the feeling he knew the song to an extent. He didn't know the, he did the, definitely didn't know the turnaround. Um, but he didn't know, like, the riff, and he was trying to play it, and he wound up harmonizing. But he was harmonizing with the acoustic guitar player, who's not playing it really the correct way. Because, uh, again... That song was originally played on clav um, clavichord, cl clavinet, one of those instruments. Um, and it doesn't really translate to guitar in the same way. So, like, there are various versions. And if you listen to, like, Jeff Beck's or Stevie Ray Vaughan's or Stevie Wonder's, they're all different. Okay? The, the way the riff is played is different. It is not the same groove, even. Um, and... I don't know exactly which one I play. I play along with the Stevie Wonder recording a lot. So I'm yep. assuming mine's closer to the Stevie Wonder version, but I honestly don't know. And I know that there's certain things that he does on the keyboard that are hard to emulate on guitar. So anyway, I, I often will play the horn part, right? I couldn't play the horn part because there was too much going on. And I was like, at some point I was like, why can't I should just grind the chords? We got to the final song and he played You Can't... He wanted to play You Can't Always Get What You Want. 
And I was like, okay, sure. And we played it with two chords and he forgot to tell us what the turnaround was. So. <laughs> yeah, you're just playing it F and C, right? You're just yeah. going back between F and it's, C. It's F and C you or G and D C minor. or something. Yeah. You just skip the well, D minor. I yeah. just play a, play the lead line over the part because I knew there was like that little thing in it. But I right. was, but you know, it's just one of those things where like, more than one person on the stage needs to know each song I think to really to really make that work but it was cool because we actually kind of like all sort of went off on a jam during that song and like I was communicating all the whole set I was locking in with Tony and I was locking in with VJ the drummer and like trying to like work something out with them because I know that those three guys do this all the time um and just trying to like make sure that we can at least make it sound like somebody knew what the hell was going on because yeah. I, de I definitely didn't. And it was really just because there's no monitor mix. And it's so funny because I grew up playing in bands with no monitor mix, no monitors at all. Um, and I'm sort of like at this point where it's like, God, how did I get through it? Because you, when you can't hear anything, it sounds like total ass. There's no way you're going to lock in with the bass player you know, there's no way you're going to lock in with another, especially an acoustic guitar player, singer. I mean, you can't even tell when the choruses are about to start because you can't hear the vocal. Um, it was just, it was kind of mind boggling. Um, I actually, a couple of those songs I got through by looking at the acoustic guitar player and not seeing where his hands were going, but seeing when his hands would shift. Because I knew the chord sequence. I was like, just, if you change your fingering, I know you're going to the next chord. <laughs> yep it was mind boggling I've never I've never had like that kind of a dumbfounded moment and then of course I get off stage and there were a couple places where I was like well at least a solo was good on this or whatever um, specifically in uh, uh, can't always get what you want oh that was our third song then we played then we played Watchtower which was too slow um, and we, we were told to like keep it keep it short so I took really short solos in it and I kind of regretted it, but I when I got off stage, I asked I asked my wife. I said, "How did it sound?" She's like, "I couldn't hear you." I was like, "God damn it!" Like it's every fucking time. <laughs> so that's I literally left there. I emailed the guy from Bareface when I got home because he's in England, right? So he'll get it. That's like his morning. So I sent I sent him an email. I'm like, "Is this gonna is this gonna solve some of the problem of being able to hear myself on stage as well as?" Make sure the audience can get something from the cabinet rather than just, you know, being super directional and lost because of some weird acoustic thing going on. He goes, yep. yes. <laughs> that was basically the response. <laughs> yes. I was. Oh, well, was that Germany? Uh, no, it was UK. Okay. And I, I was going to say, response, Germany, that's the response I'd expect. Yeah. And then I responded to him with the, uh, no, actually I didn't. I wanted to. I didn't do it. I was going to do it. I probably should. I responded to. I was going to respond with the um, the fry from Futurama thing with him going, hey, "Take my money!" <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right? Basically, like, <laughs> uh, that's how I felt. So, anyway, do you have a gig report, Jim? Yep. All right. Go for um, it. So we had a gig. Um, nice place, little place. It's it's where the recording. If you look up uh, my my Facebook page, my personal page, personal Facebook page. You still have um, one of there's those? a. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of stuff on it to be honest. Uh, join with us it. on Discord; it'll be in the uh, the notes for the show below. We're gonna start putting those links like right in the damn text, and you can just type them in if you want. Yeah, um, we uh, um, we played there. That's where the our biggest, my biggest uh, viewed. It's up to fifty two hundred views now. Um, it gets about almost a hundred a week, so mm -hmm. it's been it's been moving along um, slowly but surely. Keeping its pace. Um, your biggest, at some point, it was your biggest viewed video is the open boxing of the uh, Joe Bonamassa. Oh, the Joe Bonamassa is probably still the bigger one. Twenty five. And it's a guitar I like, didn't really like. Twenty five thousand in like a day or something. It was just nuts. I didn't actually like that guitar that much. Um, I kind of wish I had held on to it a little longer and then sold it outright because I would have made a little money on it. But anyway, <laughs> um, so. Uh, was I was I saying? Oh, so we played. That's where we're playing, um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, crowd was fantastic. 
the music was good. But as I mentioned earlier, in the beginning, we had the lights. At first, we were going like, to use any lights. Then we decided, because it's really small, we, we would put some floor lights down. And we put the floor lights down. It was literally right in my face. Couldn't see my fretboard, which is fine most of the time. Most of the time, I'm not looking at my fretboard. But once in a while, I want to look down and see where my... I couldn't see my guitar in my hands. The light was in my face that hard. So we moved it after I messed up the solo on Jesse's Girl because I couldn't figure out where the 14th fret was to save my life. <laughs> I couldn't even see my guitar. That's the truth. Um, I, I have really bad eyesight. So for those who don't know, I, I don't see well out of my left eye at all. And my right eye is, is dominant. So when my right eye gets tired, the left eye can't really help. It just kind of... And, and so it's easier for me to start losing uh, vision fast. So anyway, that was, you know. But um, uh, other than that, went really well. Did a bunch of songs. Uh, I am getting used to my ears, um, you know, and, and keeping the balance in my ears. Um, I thought people would hear uh, the other amp more out front, but people said that that was pretty well balanced, which is good out there um but in smaller places it's still tough because a guitar is very a guitar amp is very directional and so i'm in the pa i'm 100 percent the pa i'm a camper um where he might be loud in one spot and not as loud in another right four feet to the left or right of the same distance mm -hmm. so um but overall i thought it was great i had a lot of fun and uh we're we're back. We booked three more gigs off that. Um, we're there's one place we go every month that their next door neighbor booked us because we pack the parking lot so full. Their overflow goes to them, and they're like, "Hey, why have we got all this parking there?" And it's because we're packing the place next door. <laughs> so we're literally um, in competing places. Um, and we brought people from across the road over too. So yeah. we um, we're definitely the more popular uh, band um, most nights at that location, which is cool. And it's right on the water. It's really nice. People can take their boat up, or they can, you know. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of fun. Um, we're playing again. This weekend, Friday night. So, next next one, I have another gig report. Um, I'm I am not that guy trying to make money on my musicianships. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll talk more. Um, I'd like to maybe next week we can talk about um, uh, music writing and some of the some of the process for that because um, we won't be doing much for that for this week. But next week I will be doing a lot more writing. Um, so we got to. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm down good. to talk about that. I have a very, I'm actually so, sort of coming up with a prolific process, which is like unheard of. Because normally I just went on like, hey, I'll write when something comes out of me that I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna keep playing this. Um, so and that was how things become riffs. Is that like I just keep playing the same thing over and over, and eventually it's like, oh shit, I should just use this as a song for it, right? Um, right. I actually like it. So there's a reason I keep playing it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So um, I think it'd be good show content as well. Uh, yeah. I put in the chat uh, Barefaced Audio's uh, website. If anybody's yep. interested, uh, I know it's a really small company. I know they had struggles during the, the pandemic because they weren't able to get materials and stuff. If you're interested in something, if, you, if any of the stuff I told you sounds appealing, you might want to take a look at their site. Um, for our audio listeners, it is barefacedaudio.com. And, uh, the gentleman that actually runs the company, his name's Alex. He builds the cabs. I think he has a, a crew of a couple people that, that actually, um, are doing the cab building now. Um, he's got a YouTube channel and I highly recommend you go watch some of the videos. Cause he like, this is not snake oil from him. Like he believes what he's selling. Cause he's like. He, I, and, and and kind of righteous about it to a point where it's like, we're building the best cabinet cabinets on earth. And like, 
he's like legitimately staking his reputation on it. And when you go watch the videos, what you'll see is like, here's this cabinet and you're asking why this works. And like, here, let me break it down for you. Or there's one video where he takes out all the prototypes of the guitar caps because they also make bass caps. That's how they got started. He takes out every single guitar prototype cabinet and says, this one failed because of this. This one failed because of this. This one failed because of this. And this one is the Goldilocks because it had all the right combinations of pieces and elements from these others. Um, and it, like when you realize that it's that iterative of a design approach where they're actually not just like, it, it's, it's a prototype design approach. They didn't just get it right in two prototypes. He built like seven or eight. And I'm sure that he actually built more when he was building base cabinets. Because you build the bass cabs, you get all that straightened out, and then you flip and you start building guitar cabinets. You're obviously going to have some ideas in the head how that all works. And he talks about the math. Like, that's the thing that I think a lot of people miss is there's actual math involved in that process. All right. And he understands that. So not only is he a musician, like, he's done the acoustic science behind it. Um, right. And probably has more or less built the cab and then gone and proved it you know mathematically because he's like trying to figure out why why that works right mm -hmm. um you got something to add oh nope uh not to add um just uh, to uh end our show yeah, uh, yeah we gotta get that <laughs> i'm looking at the fart pedal uh kickstarter page right now I'll throw and that i just wanted chat. to mention number one it's in chicago illinois oh god um we, i, I we kid you not something like that Number two, they had a goal of thirty thousand, and they have made ninety thousand three hundred sixty-seven dollars. I think it's closed. I think I don't know how to do this. So yeah, I. Wouldn't I th yeah, um, I th it, the pro the project was brought to life, so apparently yeah. they're going to come out. So I definitely am thinking of getting one of these just as a freaking laugh, because. Uh, it's 165 bucks. Um, and it comes in a tub of tasty beans. I mean, the whole thing is just the, the funniest uh, release um, that I've ever seen. Uh, they do not take themselves seriously. Uh, that, that woman, um, what's her name? Uh, Emily something or other that does the, the guitar pedals with the harp. Yeah. Um, Emily Hopkins. She's, uh, she's got a video with it. Hilarious video, obviously not to be taken seriously. Um, like I said, anybody looking for a Miku type thing, not gonna get it. It's just random fart noises. That this is a shitty uh, pedal. Yes, <laughs> sounds like shit. I'm gonna tell you that right now. It sounds like shit. <laughs> Someone uh, gambled there, and lost on this one. Can you imagine this stuff? Highway to Hell. They have oh, a Highway man. to Hell cover with it. Will the I guy play it? I can't. Telecast. I can't. It's this is Stairway this, to Heaven. No. No. <laughs> no, I refuse. I'm not. <laughs> no. Uh, Are you looking at it? Yeah. No. Uh, the Kickstarter page. <laughs> yes. No. Um, okay. <laughs> I have been David. I've been Jim. And tonight we've been practically 